Um, for those of you who it's your first time at Thomas, I want to tell you just a little bit about us. Uh, Thomas has, has been with its roots in business um, for 126 years, and we are a place that I describe a place of hope and opportunity. About 80% of our students come from Maine and return to Maine's workforce to uh, fulfill the needs of powering the state of Maine forward. Um, about two-thirds of our students are first in their family to go to college. So this is truly a place of hope, a, truly a place of opportunity. And we deliver on those promises to our students to give them a career that is going to be meaningful, is going to be relevant to the economy regardless of where they go, to start that career. And many of our new graduates are actually uh, going into the workforce with either undergrad or graduate degrees in cybersecurity. Uh, prior to the events that we've recently been encountering over the last few weeks, I would have said cybersecurity was the number one concern of business leaders everywhere. Um, I think it's probably taken a secondary seat right now, but I will say it is continues to be one of the most important concerns facing leaders across the globe. So it's a very relevant. The conversations you're going to have today are very important. I want to welcome those to our community who come from other businesses. I want to thank all the presenters today for sharing your wisdom and guidance. I want to thank the students who are taking time to be here today because this is your future that you're going to play such an important role in. And I'm just very thankful that we're able to host you at this event uh, coming at a really important time in our history. Um, with that, I want to turn it over to Mike Duguay. And uh, Mike is the head of the Harold Alfond Institute for Business Innovation. And our college across all of our majors is focused on that nexus of operating with sound business principles, with innovation uh, in terms of our spirit, of giving our students um, the most leading edge uh, thought processes and tools to use in innovating their own future and technology. And I think today's conference really embodies all of those aspects. So welcome. I hope you enjoy your day. And thank you so much for visiting Thomas. Thanks. Thank you, President Lachance. Um, welcome again, as, as uh, Lori had said, to our campus today and coming out. Uh, we did have at least some decent weather for you, so uh, I'm very glad uh, that that actually happened as well. Uh, to just a quick lead into the conference, last night my, my daughter and my son-in-law are, are building a house out west and she called and she said, we're ordering some appliances and she said, in this one appliance on a refrigerator, what's this IOT WIFI thing? And I said, well, while you ask that, I have some people that you might want to listen to. So a lot of stuff obviously going on in cybersecurity. As you know, you can't go really one news cycle without something coming up. It's exceedingly topical, uh, incredibly important to our economy. And so I'm very pleased that uh, all of you came out here to not only uh, listen, but also to talk and uh, network with your colleagues who are really in something that's so important to the national security. Uh, and we are gonna hear from our experts today, uh, as well as uh, some other folks who are gonna uh, provide some, some video uh, conversation and comment on this. So uh, without further ado, it really is my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Frank Appen to you. Uh, Frank is not only known widely as a highly respected thought leader, professor and researcher in the area of cybersecurity, technology, project management, and business, but also teaches and has research roles here at Thomas College, St. Petersburg College, and North Central University. Frank's been an entrepreneur for well over uh, 20 years, excuse me. I don't want to give you too many more years, Frank. Uh, providing technology, security, and project management solutions to banking, healthcare, and mining sectors in North America, Europe, and in, and in Africa. Amongst his vast involvement in technology associations throughout the world, Frank is also an active member of the main chapter of InfraGuard, which is a partnership between the FBI and the private sector that works to protect critical technology uh, infrastructure around our country. And uh, you'll also be hearing uh, from them, those folks uh, as well today. Without further ado, Frank. Hi, everyone. 
everyone. Um, today we have a few things running and there's the program just as a, a refresher. Uh, there's someone from Thomas College that's going to look what's happening in the next five years, which is a really important thing. You don't want to die to find out how you shouldn't die, so you want to know what might be threatening. And I will stand a little closer and not walk around. Apologies. Um, we're then going to look at the main emergency management uh, agency with a view around that and uh, main laws that might be important to you. Uh, we have the uh, chief information officer at 215 from WEX. And there was our first cur curveball. WEX has closed down travel today. And you might have seen some activity here. Mike will be here, but virtually, all right, because we adapt and cyber folks need to be able to adapt, all right? So there's the first one. We have a few more, okay. Some of them are still playing out while I talk, <laughs> all right? Uh, we then go through to uh, a break, networking, and remember how important networking is to exchange ideas. We float across to Tyler Technology. Ron Bernier isn't here now, but he told me he's coming, so that's okay. And if it isn't, that's also okay. We'll find a way of doing it because that's what cyber people do, right? So as we go past that, we go into an important part from my uh, position, and that is a panel. And it's a panel of people that come from multiple organizations, from Raytheon, from Wex, from uh, Main Health, and from uh, SAPI. And, uh, they are four of the five Thomas graduates that are in a position to be worthy speakers at this event. And, and feel free to network with those, exchange ideas, and check out Thomas College. However, we're here about cybersecurity. And my particular role for cybersecurity is to say, well, what is going on? We're predicting the future, right? So how might we predict the future? We're going to look at 2020 to 2025. We want to prevent future problems. So we had one speaker not coming. We know of another one that's not coming. We're not sure how we're going to deliver that content to you, but we've got three backup plans, all right? And they'll play through and we'll finalize that decision during the break, all right? And you might say, well, how's that relevant? Because you're in an emergency, you're doing business planning, business uh, continuity and disaster recovery, we get involved with everything. On Monday morning, I had to become an expert on COVID-19 because I had an InfraGuard meeting and our host said, uh, we don't want people on our place. So we had to figure that out. And that is part of what we do. That's part of modern business, right? So what we need to do is we need to predict the future. So what I'd like to do is introduce to you two gentlemen as one of our speakers that talk about the solarium and the commission. But before I go there, I'm going to go through and finish our welcomes by going to uh, one of our senators and sharing that. Good afternoon on and welcome to this important my summit on cybersecurity. My thanks to Thomas College, along with the public and private sector experts, for making this event possible. Cyberspace is a place of unparalleled potential, but at the same time, it is under increasing assault on all fronts, fraud, ransomware, cyber theft, and even espionage. Computer networks around the world are being hacked, probed, and infiltrated relentlessly. Our government is not immune. China hacked the Office of Personnel Management, exposing millions of personnel records to Beijing. Russia, in 2016, likely gained access to election infrastructure systems in many states. As the theme of this conference says, we are at risk at home, work, and play. The motivation behind these cyber attacks ranges from simple mischief and massive theft to societal chaos and geopolitical and economic advantage. 
The global cost of cybercrime is estimated to be in the trillions of dollars. According to one estimate, the number of data breaches involving sensitive personal information rose by 126% between 2017 and 2018. As a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, I've been working hard to advance legislation and policies to better protect government and businesses from potentially devastating cyber attacks. Our committee released a report last year as part of our Russia investigation outlining steps our government should take to bolster election security. In addition, I've supported additional federal funding for election security improvements at the state level. Strong public-private partnerships are essential if we are to meet this challenge because neither the government nor industry can solve this problem alone. I commend the students here today for their interest in this important subject. A career in cybersecurity will be rewarding and truly make a difference. Just as information is the target of cyber attacks, information such as you will hear at this summit is our best defense. Thank you again for your involvement in this crucial issue. We have another uh, that was interested to address you. Uh, and to put my eyes on, right? Thomas the College, that's the right idea at the Thomas right time. Thomas College, the that's right the right place. idea at the right time in the right place. Congratulations on coming together to talk about cybersecurity. There could not be a more important issue for you to be engaged in. It is one of the dominant issues of the next, I don't know how long, maybe 20, 50 years, but certainly the next five to 10 years. Everything we do is connected. And we are asymmetrically wired, but that means we're asymmetrically vulnerable. And whether it's your daily life uh, in terms of your bank account or, or communications or your uh, Twitter feed or your text or larger issues of national security, election security, cybersecurity is absolutely a, an essential part, a building block of where we're going uh, in this country over the next few years. I've been privileged to serve over the past year as the co-chair of something called the National Cyber Solarium Commission, which was set up in the National Defense Act a year and a half ago in order to establish a kind of big picture strategy for the United States in dealing with this really uh, incredibly uh, powerful and dangerous issue. Uh, we're talking, I, I, I talked to a, my co-chair last night and said, you know, it really boils down to what we're talking about is deterrence. That is, how do we keep people from messing around in our networks, whether they're nation states, criminals, just garden variety hackers. And it's also organization. How do we get ourselves organized in such a way, uh, particularly at the federal level, in order to have an effective defense? So. But what you're studying and what you're going to be learning and what you're talking about is how, what do we do uh, on, the, on the network level. And by the way, this problem is only going to become more serious as we enter the age of the Internet of Things, when your refrigerator and your microwave and your car uh, all talk to one another, are all wired, are all in the network. That simply multiplies the risk. So, uh, I hope I've scared you a little bit this morning because I can tell you uh, this is an issue that scares me that I've really devoted a huge amount of time to over the past year and a half. Our commission is going to issue its report uh, actually next week and it's something that we've really put a lot of thought into and, uh, and, and so what you're doing there, pulling people together in Maine and from outside of Maine to talk about the issue, where we are, uh, what we can do, how do you develop programs at places like Thomas College to provide the educational support uh, that we need because we desperately need uh, cybersecurity uh, credentialed people uh, throughout our society, whether it's in the government or in the private sector. So, as I said at the beginning, you're at the right place at the right time. 
pursuing the right issue. Congratulations. Uh, thanks to my friend Lori Lachance for spearheading this and uh, look forward to the results of your conference. And I hope you'll uh, take the time in the next week or so uh, to Google Cyber Solarium Commission and take a look at the work we've been doing. Together, we're going to confront and beat this problem. Thanks. And Senator King threw us another curveball, right? And that's what you saw. I, I shouldn't have revealed that, but together with uh, Rep Gallagher, and notice we've now got all three political dimensions here, uh, went into the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, CSC, which could also be critical security control for cyber students, right? Okay. Uh, so what is that about? Let's have a look at that. Um, the system or what their objective is in terms of where they're going. It's backed by the president. It comes out of Congress. It comes from various places. There are two objectives. What strategic approach will defend the United States against cyber attacks of significant consequences? There are significant consequences. And when I say we've got to predict the future, we don't want to burn so we learn that we shouldn't burn. We need to look ahead. And that becomes a, a theme. And what we've just had is different political feet, uh, uh, leaders say, this is real. It's going to last 20, 30 years. And it's going to become overpowering. It's a very significant thing. So let's take that a little further. What does the Cyber Sol Space Solarium Commission, they say, we need to shape cyberspace so that we can have responsible behavior. In other words, no silly business, no evil business, no yucky business, and all of that. We've got to shape what happens, because if we leave it totally uncontrolled, that might mean that we aren't safe. And that also says we don't want to go too far, and that's why it says responsible behavior. It doesn't mean closed behavior, right? And then the second one is to deny the benefits to our adversaries. In other words, you can try and attack us, but no, it's not going to work. And secondly, you're not going to be able to do evil stuff to you, you, and everybody else in this audience or our country without there being consequences. All right? And those need to be reasonable and measured, but there will be consequences. And we will impose costs through capability, capacity, credibility to retaliate. In other words, a type of cyber dominance to preempt things. Right? And what we have at the moment is we've been there. And if you're interested, I'm not going to go into the details, just go and browse shadow brokers and, and look at it. And Wikipedia is fine, all right? But you'll find out that there's real stuff happening there. Our students right now are doing cyber warfare, so they're looking at every part of the country. But if we look at that, the Solarium Commission is looking to reform the U.S. government structure for a safer cyberspace. They are looking to strengthen the norms and non-military tools to protect civilians as well, right? Promote national resilience. We've got to work together and not be divided. We want to reshape the ecosystems so that we're safer. How does it work and how does it become a little more difficult to do bad stuff? We operationalize that in terms of, let's be buddies. And, and I understand that as president of InfraGuard in Maine, that's what we are all about, is we can walk and talk and learn from each other. And even if we are competitors in the business or the health world or the banking world, we should still be able to tell each other as we look after our own, right? And then finally, preserve em and employ a military instrument of power so that people can't go and do bad stuff in other places and we never have a way of defending ourselves. So that's what various political parties are doing. But my project objectives, that was an interrupt. When did I get that? Well, <coughs> yesterday, after all the slides were finalized, all our speakers were saying, can't come back with more, it's done. No, it wasn't because someone somewhere released something important. But my objective is to predict the future. People, laws, smart machines, data criminals, and cyber warfare. So if we look at that, let's have a look at predicting the future. Can we predict the future? And I believe we can predict the future because if I think of a normal burglar, I think, where can they come in my home? 
And if I put a burglar bars up there, where they're going to come in next? So I look at what I can do to defend, and then I look at what they will do in response, and then I'll decide what I do next. Well, you just start doing that, and I'm comfortable to tell you that containerization, Kubernetes, that uh, Docker, that uh, 5G, that uh, IoT, that I am, and all of those other things are going to be front center. You've got to know these now. And, and I have no doubt that I'm 100% right that all of these will be really important. And all I'm doing is the simple technique I shared. And, and we can learn that technique, and we do learn that technique. But if we look at people, there are all sorts of things that are super useful. But sometimes you've got to ask yourself a few really basic questions. We're in Web 2.0, so we don't have to pay for everything. And it's all free. These people buy machines, and they give them, make them work for us. Pay people, and they'll do, and it's all free. Change your ideas. Time up. It's not free. You are being sold. Your information is being sold. We are selling to you. Google's revenue model is a lot of free stuff, but we will make a lot of money out of marketing using your information, right? So whenever it's free, ask yourself a question, why is it free? So if you look at TikTok, there are all sorts of backends. Did you know that it's a favorite for people that look at young people uh, uh, and, and um, sexual predators and all of those? It's a big deal because this is a great channel to move and influence and share. It's also a channel where the security of the basic channel isn't good enough to the extent that if you are US military, you may not ever use TikTok. Now you might say, I've got nothing to lose. I'm, I'm honest and, and legal. Yeah, but there are holes in there. Let's talk about Snapchat, all right? Snapchat is, I send you a message and it disappears if you don't read it, so it's okay, no one finds it except they lost 1.7 pass million passwords and someone could look at every message you get from then on end and get machines to do it. Uh, there have been two other breaches that aren't detailed, so I can't tell you what they were, but I know there were breaches. I've got the logs on those. So as we look at free things and, and do stuff like that, do you want to worry about them a little bit, all right? And yes, I put in a garage door uh, uh, opener uh, two and a half years ago, well, a little less than that, middle of winter it broke, I put it in, and sure nuts, it had an antenna. And I thought, I'm scared. Why am I scared? Not that the garage door opener is going to attack me, but I'm going to have a little computer that bad people could take over and then attack me from within my own network. So I was nervous, and I'm a little too nervous. And I'm not saying we should all be that nervous. But whenever you get to these things, I need you to say, stop, think, am I OK? If someone's using TikTok, stop, think, is it OK? And if we can do that to our children and our grandparents and all the others, we are going to be safer. We're going to be safer at home, work, and at play. And I think that we also need to look at where we are in terms of what are the criminals doing with your information? Well, it's obviously credit cards. But let me go to the third bullet over there. Why babies? Why do criminals want to steal the identity of a baby? The thing is, if I take that, it's going to take you 12 to 18 years before you realize I've been using that identity. So the identity of a baby is actually worth more than an adult like us, because they can work with it a lot longer. And why do they go off after companies? As you'll hear from Ron Bernier from Tyler, uh, ransomware has totally changed. You know, it used to be the little police station for $300 and this for $500 and that. Now they're in the $1 million bracket. And Thomas students knew this was coming. Hear me now, they are going to 10 and $50 million scenarios as they develop their technology to overcome our defense. What is our defense? It's air gap, right? So that's what they're working. So the, I put burglar bars up here, what they're going to do next? Am I ready for that? Okay, I'm going to put beams over there. I'm going to, 
you can predict that and start saying, all right, air gap's good for now, what am I going to do next? And start thinking and looking at those uh, scenarios and how you could go further from there. If we take another step and we say we've got people covered, how's about laws? GDPR is a European law, so it doesn't apply to me, right? GDPR is about the privacy of European citizens. So in theory, if I come to your shop and buy something from you and you take my information, and I don't even tell you I'm a European, I come from Europe, right? You're still subject to GDPR. Now they're never gonna find you for a really small business, but if I was Hannaford or someone else, I'd be worried. Because you see, it's quite simple. If you lose the data, if you hang on to the data, then you really have to. They will take 4% of your sales, not profit, in every country, in every location, throughout planet Earth, and maybe the space station as well. So guess what? You are humbled and under the control of the GDPR, which is privacy for European citizens. We have the United States working on this, and it's going to influence you. So let's have a little look at that and see what the options are. In California, we've got CCPA, which says, oh, we've got security here, and the, any organization that deals with a Californian citizen has to say, this is the data we got, allow you to see the data, allow you to delete the data, allow you to specify where you may not go and all the rest of it. So luckily we aren't in California. We're in Maine, far from everywhere. And up to you last night, we didn't have COVID, everybody else did, so we're okay. Time out. I heard this afternoon here someone saying COVID might have a case in Maine. That changed, all right? Uh, time out. Any Californian citizen's information that you have, you are subject to that Californian law. Sorry, you, no place to hide. Oh, and then Massachusetts, SD 341, that's going backwards and forwards, which is sort of like that, a little further, and you've got a little, you know, $2,500 fine per person, and 7500 if you didn't really look after it. So if you've got someone that's got access to 100,000 names in your company, what have you got? A $100 million fine staring at you. All right. I've got to say this to my students. It's not time to become neurotic and not sleep tonight. But we need to be aware of the threats. And we need to have people in our community and people, we, places we can go to find a safer route. We can turn off all technology. Yeah, right, show me that. All right? And some of us could, and someone might start a community that does subsistence farming, no electricity, and especially no internet. All right. And I think that'll happen. That's part of my prediction. In the next 10 years, we will have a few communities like that. All right? but they're different areas. We had a ma an MBA student that started a detox business, internet detox, and he ran, figured out this whole business. Uh, that was two years ago. So yes, we got that thought, but technology delivers so much value that without quartering, coming down, losing a lot of humans, we can't deliver to all the people. So we sort of addicted, and with 5G and other things, you're gonna addict your organization and your family with more. So we sort of, you locked into a need to defend ourselves. We actually don't have an option on this. So we need a lot of skills. In Maine, we've got S, uh, LD946, which comes into effect as of the 1st of July. And that says that if an ISP, a service provider, the person that gives you internet, there are a whole range of things they can or cannot do and huge penalties. And it's a little unclear. Uh, Peter Guffin has written on this. He's a leading lawyer in this part of the privacy world. So we've got some uncertainties coming through on the 1st of July, but it is privacy quite different to California and Massachusetts. But Maine has acted, all right? So, 
How are you going to do this? We have no chance of having enough people to do all the protection that we need. That's why if you're in cybersecurity, you're going to have multiple job offers and you're going to get paid too much. <laughs> no, really, you are. You're going to get overpaid. All right? And you're going to see some of them today. You're going to get overpaid because we don't have enough. So what we could do is we could do artificial intelligence. We make the machines smart so we don't need smart people. You good with that? Okay. What does the enemy do when you got machines doing your cyber defense? Well, they're going to say, how are we going to overcome that, right? Remember, the project, can we project what's going to happen? We've got to think what the enemy thinks, right? And the enemy thinks, oh, they've got AI. How do I break AI? Well, I can look at Wikipedia and spend about 15 minutes in Wikipedia, and I'll figure out that AI has a pile of algorithms, rules. Pile of rules that looks like a lot of data or information. So, me with the evil, horrible beard, and I'm attacking you, what would I do? Well, I'd go and poison your data so that when I attack from this internet address, you go and open your firewall so that I can walk straight in. Because I've messed up your system that protects you to, in fact, harm you. So I look at that around there and we say, ah, are we going to stop that? Well, we're going to protect the data, right? But we've got to get smarter than the enemy, right? So we're going to do, hmm, how's about machine learning? You know, and if we go to Eric Brynjolfsson, he said, you know, when they let the computers at IBM go and surf the internet openly and learn themselves, what happened? They learned a lot more and they started using profanities, <laughs> right? So machine learning's there, but what I just said, told you there will remind you that I can manipulate that machine learning as well. So fellow humans in this audience, we can use machines, but we still need you. We need you. And we need you, even if you don't want to be a specialist, to be a little more sensitive. Look at a couple of sites. What sites? Well, there are a couple. If you want to look at COVID, where do you go? CDC.gov, right? All right? What do you do if it's cyber? You go to the FBI and you go to DHS. And there are lots of free resources. If you run a small business, there's a small business association. And if you want to be nice to Thomas, come and speak to us. We'll have some students help you. All right, please, it's controlled. Students will never go and do things that might put you at risk. So we will work with that as we have done with the main municipal association previously, that these are wonderful projects for students to do. And that's just an offer if you want to. And we might do that remotely via WebEx. Some of you might have seen that WebEx is running here. And there's the reason. You can see a little orange thing there. Well, that was our other little crisis that we sorted out for you before you got going, all right? So things change, is what I'm saying. You have to be agile. And after machine learning, we get what? Deep learning. That's like deep fake. You know, you, I can manipulate that, and the machines can decide what they have to learn, and they'll tell us what they learned because they thought we should know that. And that's great with automation. But are we ready for it? This isn't gloom and doom. The world chess camp, a champion, quoting Eric Brynjolfsson, isn't a machine. I mean, a cell phone can beat a grandmaster, right? A machine can bring, uh, uh, do the grandmaster. People can't beat the machine. But when I put a team of people and machines together, and we get the strength of those two methods, no grandmaster and no machine can beat the combination of the machine with the human. And my point is, despite all the gloom and doom that I've been speaking about, let's become buds with the machines. <laughs> How many machines love you? I joke, you realize that. 
but it's a path to the future that our students learn, predict the next five years, figure out how those things come together and what is going on. Yeah, but what about machine learning and deep learning? All right, how do I create 50,000 automobile accidents in New York? Well, once we have electronic cars, automated cars, all that I do is I hack the map and say all the roads are 50 feet this way. So now you turn left or right, what are you going to do? Hit a building, right? And you're not looking at the steering wheel. So we have to look at these things like automation and say there's wonderful value being created. We need cybersecurity to help defend that value. And that's where we want our students and all the others around to know a little more so that they can do a little more and take it one step further and get us to be safer. And that's where our learning goes, but I also appeal to you to be a little more aware. So what about those data criminals? There are many players and many markets. Ron Bonaire is going to give you a little more on that shortly. And we see how you're not fighting a data criminal. We can't put them in jail because any data criminal that's worth their salt, where they're going to be? New York City, Maine? No, they're going to be in some country where we can't get them. And if we have no influence in the world, they can be anywhere. So they are very limited at where they can be, fortunately. But all I need to do is make one little hole in the fence into America and you're done for. And we've got to defend everything. That's asymmetric, right? Your defense is everything. But if I want to penetrate into your land, I only need a little hole to walk in, right? Whether that be a real fence or an internet hole. So we, we have some challenges. Uh, the last number I had was approaching 1.1 trillion. The data is old. I haven't got an authoritative source, although I can tell you about a senator that told us that it's many trillions by now, right? You heard that earlier here today. They are safe. They are specialists. They really don't care about humans. Just like drug criminals don't care. Except cyber criminals have three to four times more money than all the drug criminals have. So to defend is a big business. But it's team sport. You and your machine and all the other humans working together, the human firewall, a little bit of knowledge goes a long way. And don't just say, I'd rather put my head under the, the sand, it's OK. I don't want to hire someone that tells me the truth, because if I don't know it, I don't have to worry. I'd say, know it and learn not to worry, but work towards more safety, all right? And, and that's why I'm vacillating from one side to the other. So as we decide, with the Thomas College plugged in, do you want to unplug? I put it to you, we cannot afford to unplug. We want a safer plug, and we want to make sure only the good things come in, and that we still have some freedom to do what we as humans in the United States expect to do. But there are enemies. There are a lot of enemies. And the obvious ones that mean to do us harm are well known. I'm just going to mention the top four. Oh, by the way, did you see Senator King mention the same top four? China, Russia, NOCO, North Korea, and Iran. They aim to do us immense harm. Sometimes just because they want to do us harm or purely they want to pull ahead. So why is there an F-35 flying at another nation, in another nation's air force? They didn't develop it. They got the ideas here. One of the senators mentioned espionage. It's going on and it's in Maine and it's here now. I didn't say maybe. I made a flat out statement. And I'm quite serious. So if we look at, at cyber warfare, those are nation states. Some need money. Which nation wants money through doing evil things? Which country? All right. Most of them, the data criminals everywhere. But a country that runs 
on taking money is North Korea. That's, they specialized in, in that, all right? They want what you know, my example of the airplane, but how's about uh, titanium oxide? Where DuPont, ever heard of that company, had wonderful science and they lost a multi-billion dollar business by some people that were just coming in and they ended up taking that and that was the end. They, they lost that whole market, all right? So there are a lot of places that we want to be aware of is that. So what happens if we have no sewage? If we have no water, hospitals, banks, electricity? Each one of those have been tested by foreign nations over the last 15 years. So we need to be cautious. We look, need to look there. We don't need to be preppers, but we need to be conscious and help each other as we go forward. They want to know what you do. They want to know what you buy and all of those scenarios. We can be safe. So what's that little red line on the globe there? That represents, for an unknown reason, that the internet between Washington and California didn't go down the coast. It went via Shanghai. We don't know why, but we don't like it. There is stuff going on that is real, and we need to be cautious. We should not be neurotic. We should be cautious. Just like we are with the COVID virus, it's no different. We need to be ready for the unknown, even though we predict the future. And we've got it happening right here at Tavis College because we cater and cope with those scenarios. So with that, what I'd like to do is go back and invite our next guest to come, uh, come up. Uh, we have from Maine Emergency Management Agency, uh, Hunter Quinlan, he's a Thomas graduate, uh, and he does cyber in the state, but he has a slide that includes some of his information, so I'm not going to read it out, but what I'll do, sir, is give you your slides. The clicker might not collaborate, but they've got keys, all right? Thank you. Hi, everyone. As uh, Dr. Appen said, my name is Hunter Quinlan. I, am, uh, I work for Maine Emergency Management Agency, uh, publicly known as MEMA. And my position there is actually the uh, senior cybersecurity planner. Um, so I work a lot with the public infrastructure, critical infrastructure, um, and cyber incident response management, and uh, uh, grant funding opportunities for them. Um, so a quick background of me. I'm a double major from Thomas. I graduated last May. Um, I have a cybersecurity major and a computer science part-time law enforcement, and I, like I said, I now work as the senior planner of cybersecurity. Uh, before that, I uh, started working in cybersecurity at the state. Uh, there I ran cyber incident response with the security team and phishing exercises, um, and before that I worked at SAPI, as you'll see from Dash, same company. Uh, so my job with MEMA actually covers, I'm actually under the Department of Homeland Security. Um, so that means that I work with the critical infrastructure, the uh, 16 sectors of critical infrastructure. Um, and I bring this up because there's one caveat to all of this, and that's under and according to the Department of Homeland Security, uh, we all have a sector of critical infrastructure in our businesses, and that's information technology. Um, so under that, we can all sort of start looking at, you know, okay, what's out there in terms of help from the federal government uh, for information sharing and for actually incident response since we have a, a, a sector of critical infrastructure in our business. Um, there's four things that I really want to run through here, and it's going to be more of awareness, information sharing, and uh, reporting. And then we're also going to talk about a main law. It's Title 210, uh, it's, sorry, it's t Title 10, Chapter 210B. Um, and it's about reporting uh, a cyber incident. Um, so I had to sort of cater this towards the private sector, and I actually I should have asked this before I got started, but how many people here actually work in the public sector? Okay, so this is actually going to be really good. And the rest of you, I'm guessing, are uh, private sector and students. Is that correct? Yeah, okay, cool. So this is actually going to work out pretty well. So the, uh, the agencies that I'm actually going to show you here are agencies that I use for information sharing, awareness, and reporting. Um, and I wanted to share those out with you because they seem to be, from my experience, um, unknown to most people. 
They, most people think that just because it's a government agency means that they can't get help from it when in fact they can actually get some portion of help from that agency. Um, so we're going to start with awareness. Um, two that I like are the Internet Crime Complaint Center, you might know them as IC3, and the National Council of Information Sharing and Analysis Centers. Um, some of you may know that as the MSISAC, the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Um, but to start, the IC3 actually has a fantastic press room that's free for everybody and it monitors all current cyber incidents. They also have their annual cyber crime report, so I usually put that out as a great way for funding if you're trying to find funding for cyber, cybersecurity, anything in your business. And it's free for anyone. Anyone can look at the press room. Anyone can go and look at the reports. Anyone can receive the newsletters. You don't need to be critical infrastructure or public sector. Um, another one is the National Council of Information Sharing and Analysis Centers. They actually have, uh, I think it's 26 or 27 different ISACs uh, for everything across the sectors of critical infrastructure, including some that aren't uh, in critical infrastructure. They all have their own automated sharing of threat intelligence. They all have a form of reporting, and some of them, some of them, I want to stress that, some of them have incident response that you can actually reach out to, and they will help you with the cyber incident that you have. Uh, they also have analyst to analyst ex exchanges, so you can talk to another peer in another, uh, another company, another organization, another state, wherever you are. And the MSISAC, if you actually look at it, if you're public infrastructure, uh, the MSISAC has a CIS secure suite, which is a suite of tools and it changes on a quarterly or monthly basis, depends on how long they keep them in rotation. And you can usually pick up uh, nice cybersecurity tools for either free or a severely discounted price, uh, just the way that the, the government is trying to push a cybersecurity footprint. Another one is uh, information sharing, and we're going to move into this. You actually heard Dr. Appen and I think um, Mr. Dugari talk about InfraGuard. And I looked at InfraGuard a lot for their FBI flash alerts. Um, they're fantastic if there's something big going on because you get it almost instantly. And I couple that with DHS CISA, which is DHS, which is Department of Homeland Security, uh, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Agency. I partner those two uh, because if they're, if they're releasing something, it's obviously something you want to be looking at. Um, and their newsletters and their alerts are probably some of the more important information that I get in my job because that's what I need to release back out to the counties, the towns, and any public or critical infrastructure that we're working with. Uh, so the InfraGuard, if any, if, uh, has it, is anybody here familiar with InfraGuard as it is? A few? Okay. So the InfraGuard is a private, uh, it's a private sector partnership with the FBI, meaning that as long as you're a sector of critical infrastructure, and as I just said, we're all IT, or we have IT, so therefore we have a sector of critical infrastructure in our business, you can sign up for newsletters from the FBI, and that grants you access uh, to threat analysis and intelligence, and that also uh, great, um, grants you access to alerts for upcoming events and conferences uh, that cater towards that sector of critical infrastructure. But it's very important to remember that if you sign up for IT, you're going to get information about information technology and cyber alerts. Uh, DHS cybersecurity, I'm actually on a very good terms with them. We contact them for a lot of things. Um, they, are, they offer some of the better alerts for cybersecurity issues right on their website too. If you go out there, you can, you can see it clear as day. You don't need to be signed up for a newsletter, although I am. It goes right to your inbox if that's the case. Same thing as InfraGuard. Um, you have your bulletins. If you do sign up, they provide the weekly summaries and patch information. And the patch information is actually uh, pretty comprehensive as well. It, it, uh, it's determined based off of what kind of applications there are and what kind of operating systems, you, operating systems you're using. And it'll level out the securities. It'll categorize the security uh, vulnerabilities for you that way. Uh, they also have in-depth analysis reports on new cyber threats, which is something that I love because you can look at it and you can automatically see everything that they know about it and everything that you need to do to protect yourself against it. Uh, the federal, uh, for planning, we have the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, and these guys are fantastic. Uh, you might not think so, but if you actually go out to their website, <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah, don't worry, I get the jokes, we're from the government, we're here to help. So if you actually go out to their website, they have a free to use virtual planner. And what that does is you can actually take in their uh, cybersecurity policy guidance and examples. You can actually go to their website and they'll create you a generic cyber policy that you then just have to craft towards your, com towards your company. Like you go through and you can select through a ton of different options is what you need as a section of your cyber policy. And you can just pop that right into your plan. 
and then you cater it towards your company so you can go in and you can modify it as you need it. Uh, Ready.gov is another great tool for planning. They don't have as comprehensive tools as the FCC in terms of example and guidance plans, but they actually do have some testing and improve, uh, improvement uh, recommendations. Plus they have some training, which is a huge problem for most companies and organizations, is the fact that they don't train. They don't plan and they don't train. Uh, moving into policy, Dr. Appen mentioned uh, small business administration. Um, I found this one to be pretty useful, but it's not as comprehensive as the FCC, uh, InfraGuard, or DHS CISA. Um, they don't really offer fantastic tools, but what they offer are comprehensive tools that will get you started and then you move up from there. So if you're starting at the baseline level, I would highly recommend looking at the U.S. Small Business Administration and they'll get you going with common threats. They can actually, they actually have tools to help you assess your business risks. Uh, they actually have cybersecurity best practices to push out to your employees and they also have training and events that you can take part in and push those out to your employees as well. Now, the huge, huge, huge agency that I look at for anything planning is NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Anytime that I'm looking at creating a plan, uh, anytime that I'm pushing a county, a town, a municipality, any public infrastructure towards looking at a plan, we always look to NIST. Uh, it's the one agency that the federal government looks at that is actually not a federal agency. Um, so if you look at MEMA's plan, the way that we wrote it, is we actually look at the policy guidance in NIST SP 800-53 and I push anybody that I talk to to go and look at this document because it will tell you exactly what you need to include in a policy plan or in a plan to have it meet NIST standards and typically there are you know, a few bullets, a few checklists here, a couple paragraphs you have to put in but as long as you meet all those points you can pass it on as a NIST, as a NIST approved plan. Um, the other one that we look at is 800-84 for testing, training, and exercises. This sets up you know, what you need to test, what you need to train on, and how often you need to exercise that plan in order for it to still be valid. Um, once again, I push this one out to all towns, counties, municipalities, any public infrastructure, and I work with it myself. Everything I'm showing you, I work with, I work with NIST myself, and we use it at MEMA. Um, other things that I pushed out are the cybersecurity framework, which is like the foundation for anything cybersecurity and the maturity model, which varies based on your industry that you're in. Um, so in terms of policy, I would, I would strongly recommend that anybody that's looking for any policy go straight to NIST and they start digging through their special publications and what they need to comply to in order for them to be compliant for any federal audit. Or not any federal audit, but you get the point. So I wanted to save some time for the main laws. Really, there's only one, but last time I talked about this, it took up a pretty good amount of time. So if you guys have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask right off the bat. Um, I wanted to save time for this and for a reason. So does anybody know that there's actually a, uh, a law regarding the notice of risk to personal data in Maine? By show of hands, does anybody actually know that? Okay, so there's a few. So how many of you here actually have pers an employee or a customer's personal data at their workplace? By show of hands. Okay. So, and how many of you know that there's a law that mandates the reporting and the fines that are around the release of or the uh, unauthorized access, as the law states, for that? You do. Okay, for that information. Okay. So, this law is fairly short. Um, it's fairly unknown as well, um, but it's also fairly comprehensive in a way. Um, the one thing I do tell everybody that I show this to is you're going to want your attorneys to look at it to make sure that you guys are in compliance with it. Um, the good news is in the public infrastructure, it's a little, or sorry, in state, local, and county governments, it's a little bit different as to how it applies to them, um, but it does apply to everybody other than the, United, the university main systems and the state government, of course. Um, so the biggest thing that we want to look at is um, who it applies to, and that is an information broker that maintains computerized data um, that's straight off, off the bat, it's any broker that maintains computerized data, whether it's third party or first party, whether it's your company protecting your employees or whether you've outsourced that to another company. So um, I didn't print this off for everybody because that would have been like three trees worth and I figured Sappy was getting enough business as it was, so we didn't need to worry about that. Um, but it's a notification to residents clause in this law 
and that states that an information broker that maintains computerized data that includes PII, that broker shall, upon notification of, upon them being notified of a breach of that data, shall report the breach to the customers in a reasonable and prompt manner. And the second clause to that is an information broker that maintains computerized data that includes PII, that broker shall conduct a reasonable and prompt investigation into the cause of the breach. So you have not only have the report of the breach, but you also have the investigation to the breach. And both of those carry the same penalty, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, the other clause to this is really for the private sector. Um, if more than 1,000 1, persons PII is breached at a single event, that broker shall notify without unreasonable delay. They shall notify consumer reporting agencies and compile, that compile and maintain files on nationwide consumers. That's actually federal code right there. Um, so that also means that if you're pri private sector, you need to also notify any consumer reporting agencies and let them know what's going on. Um, there is an exception, and we'll get into that in a minute, but I wanted to get through the law first. So the violation for this law is actually a civil violation. Uh, you're probably not looking at jail time, um, but you are looking at a fine of not more than $500 per violation, uh, but it's up to a maximum of $2,500 for each day the broker is in violation of this chapter. So according to this law, Per violation actually means per person. So that can mean that there was one, but there was one breach, but there was 100 people's data in that breach. So now it's $500 per person. But then you also have the maximum of $2,500 for each day the broker is in violation of this data. So really it's $2,500 per day per breach, depending on how many people you have. So if you have one person's data that was leaked out, that's $500 per day. But if you have five people's data, that's $2,500, and that's $2,500 or anything over that. Does that make sense? So the other thing is the notice must be made no more than 30 days after the person identified in paragraph A or B, which is the two that we first looked at, becomes aware of the breach of security and identifies its scope. So you have 30 days to make that notification, and that's stated by statute. You have 30 days to make that notification to either your consumers or um, actually it's just to your consumers at this point, and also to the uh, reporting agency if you're, to the consumer reporting agency if you're a private industry. So the biggest question that everybody has about this law is who do I report it to? And that's the fun one to answer because it's a little bit, it's a little difficult. Everybody thinks that, you know, you report it to 911 and you're good, but the problem is, <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, that's the response that I expect, is that everybody knows 911 can't handle any kind of cyber threat. They're not trained on it. They also don't, they, they've never handled it. Um, the good news is working as a part-time law enforcement, I actually see it in our reporting systems that, you know, oh, hey, look, you can report a cyber threat, but never have I ever actually seen one come through. So it's, it's kind of interesting that we even have it. Um, the notice of breach of security of the system is required under subsection 1, which we looked at previously, that person shall notify the appropriate state regulators within the Department of Professional and Financial Regulation or the Attorney General if that person is not regulated by professional and financial regulation. So depending on what your industry is, if you are regulated by professional financial regulation by the state of Maine, you report to them, and if you are not, you report to the Attorney General. And that report goes directly to the, to the Attorney General. And essentially what they're looking for is what happened and how long did it take you to notify. Um, so the, the bit, one of the big issues here, though, is that when you notify, um, there's an exception to the notification law, and that's if you have law enforcement investigating the cause of the breach. So if you believe it to be criminally, um, cr if you believe there to be a criminal tie and you're investigating it with law enforcement, you can actually finish your investigation with law enforcement, but then you have seven days to, to um, release the information to the consumer and the reporting and the consumer reporting agencies. So you, you have a little bit, you have an exception there, but that exception only exists if you're reporting it to law enforcement and they're conducting an investigation. Um, so does anybody have any questions on that law or anything? Uh, did I not cover anything? Yes. For those industries that are federally regulated and federal reporting requirements, 
Mm -hmm. Does that meet the standard of making the report, or do you also have to report it new? Nope. If it's, if it's federally regulated, if it's a federal industry, then this law does not apply to that federal industry. It does not apply. If you are federally regulated and you have federal regulations of reporting, this law does not apply. This law is, this law is essentially for anybody under those federal regulations of reporting. Does that make sense? Good? Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. Anybody else? No? Cool. So reporting, the fun one. Um, Maine is actually working on trying to um, revamp our cyber reporting and response um, procedures, which is kind of why I'm at MEMA, is we're working through and we're kind of spearheading how we're responding to cyber incidents. Uh, when it's public sector, whether when it's a town, a county, a municipality, um, a water district, we're, I, I would almost say that we're, we're kind of there. Um, we have a little bit more work to do, but, but the progress that we've made in the last year um, is really starting to show and the communication that's there and the response efforts that we've put forward is really resonating with that community so they know that they can actually contact MEMA at this point and we can get them the help that they need. When it comes down to the private sector and those that aren't covered by public infrastructure but are still critical infrastructure like we showed have information technology, um, you guys can actually report out to DHS CISA, which I brought up earlier in the slideshow. And the reporting there, I actually really want to stress this. Um, DHS CISA, if you're private industry, is really going to push you to finding local help. And they're going to push you to find that local help where you don't have, you can't use the federal help, um, but they want to offer you federal resources. So they might actually help you get in touch with, with local and private sector help for your problem, for your cyber incident, but you cannot use the, the, federal, the federal response efforts like a public sector person can or a public sector entity can. Um, so I'm bringing this up to show you that if you actually go out to CISA, to DHS CISA, you can go to their reporting tab and you can actually report incidents, phishing, malware, vulnerabilities, or just share indicators. Um, and the federal government, believe it or not, actually, if you have a cyber team or a uh, threat hunting team, they actually love it if you find uh, vulnerabilities on their websites and then report it to them because that's just free labor for all and they like that. So when you report to the federal, to the federal government uh, for any malware, phishing, anything like that, do not expect a real-time response, okay? It is slow and it is backlogged like you wouldn't believe. The only reason we get a response is because we have a direct line to them. That's why I also brought up the ISACs though, is because if you actually are a part of an ISAC that has a reporting function, you will get a response within 24 hours. Uh, and they will actually offer you help. But you have to be a part of an ISAC with, a, with that function. Um, and that doesn't mean you know, go and apply to an ISAC with that function just because. That means that if you're a part of that ISAC, they will offer you help and it's free. And it's 24-7. They have 24-7 security operations centers. Um, I was actually on the phone with CISA last night telling him what we were doing today and he did want me to stress that it's not going to be real time and, but if they do respond it's all dependent on what their backlog looks like and what the and what the size and scope of the cyber incident looks like so you might get help from CISA you know if your whole company is crumbling and you have you know 10,000 records and you're some huge bank you might actually get some help from them and another day you might actually get help if you're a small company, but it all depends on the size, scope, and what they're dealing with at that time. Um, so I think with that, that actually, uh, that really finishes up what I had to say. I wanted to leave some time for questions if anybody had any. If not, I think, you know, I just want to save you guys some time. I don't have any cards, so if you wanted to talk more in depth, I highly recommend uh, taking down my information because, like I said, I forgot them at work on a perfect day like this. Um, I am on LinkedIn as well, but please feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I'm better at responding to those than I am at phone calls. So, thank you. Our keynote speaker is, is not here because of company regulations, but we've got WebEx running, and that's another one of our adapt and adjust to reality as things come. So, I'm getting going to just change a few things here. Mike Leonerth, who is the Chief Information Security Officer at WEX, and he's been there for the five, uh, past five years. 
uh, as an information security and risk management executive, he's been out there for 25 years learning, trying, solving, and helping organizations succeed. If we look at his role and we think about Wix that is in multiple countries and multiple states and has thousands of users and billions of dollars of payment, payments going through them, it's a significant thing where he's done risk management, IT auditing, project management, and business operations experience. How do we create the value and how do we defend the value, right? He has extensive experience in the financial services industry, including security strategies to mitigate the internal as well as external threats. He's been involved with managed services, things like outsourcing, right? We've been looking at, he's looked at uh, cloud migrations, board and executive <laughs> management presentations, and the ex execution of constantly evolving security, as we've heard about today. He's responsible for addressing the critical risks inherent with the use of teach a technology that supports business operations and the corporate mission at Wix. I present to you in a virtual mode, Mike Leonhardt. Uh, so this is Mike Leonhardt, uh, CISO at Wix. Uh, apologize, I can't be there in person. Uh, I think uh, everyone knows why with this uh, virus stuff that's going around, but um, was in my car about to head north and I uh, got the call to uh, hang back. So hopefully we're going to try to still be effective here on WebEx. Um, let me start by giving you a little more on my background. Um, I know the audience is, is varied. We've got probably some students and uh, business people and academic uh, folks. But um, the one question I get often asked is, what is a common path to security leadership, whether it's CISO or other uh, security leadership position? And I'll tell you a little bit about my story. I think there are many paths, but for me, I um, graduated uh, from Virginia Tech with a degree in accounting information systems. And actually my first job was as an EDP auditor. Uh, standard stood for uh, electronic data processing uh, back in the day. So uh, after doing that for a few years and went going to another company as an auditor, I then joined KPMG uh, down in Virginia uh, and did a lot of information risk management consulting services, uh, providing security um, strategy, secu uh, security architecture, even penetration testing. I was a certified ethical hacker at one point. Um, then, or after 10 years with KPMG, I joined Freddie Mac in the Washington, D.C. area and led the information security risk and governance team there uh, for about five or six years. And then this opportunity in Maine came up with WEX. Uh, I never heard of WEX and uh, actually didn't really know where Maine was. I knew it was up north somewhere. It seemed like a long way away. But uh, have been up here now six years, have loved it, uh, and have been lucky enough to be part of a great organization that's grown fast. Actually, when I started, it's been six years now, uh, we had five people in information security, and now we're uh, close to 40. So it's been uh, a lot of fun to build a program, uh, to be to play my little part in uh, the growth of the, uh, this organization. Um, the agenda we have today is uh, up on the screen in a second. Um, we're going to talk about some recent headlines, probably things most of us have heard about. I'm going to dive into a bit of the who, who are these threat actors, what are they motivated by, what are their what we call TTPs, uh, techniques, tactics, procedures. Um, explore a li little bit about the uh, attack surface, how distributed and varied it is, and uh, dive into some of the specific threat, me uh, threat vectors and countermeasures that uh, are common and that we can consider both as an organization and individually um, ourselves. And I think there's some time at the end for some Q&A. So we're going to try to make this interactive. We have a if you have a smartphone or device with you, 
Um, you can actually go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com. Um, and on the home screen, there's a dialog box. If you type in plugged in, P-L-U-G-G-E-D-I-N, this question, I think, will pop up. And it's just a, we're going to try a little way to engage with you guys and just uh, solicit an overall view from the audience uh, to what extent you have ever fallen victim to social engineering, phishing, um, et cetera, and maybe downloaded malware, exposed information uh, unknowingly, et cetera. So I think, Kate, that is on the screen like that. Is this? Oh, I need a vote. Okay. 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 We're up to 30 people who have voted thus far, so that's good. Seems to be working. <laughs> we'll give this uh, another few seconds here. Looks like the uh, yeses are winning at the moment. Thirty-seven, thirty-nine, forty. So well, this is great. So so far, we're just over sixty percent of folks have experienced some sort of a, a, a phishing incident, a malware incident, uh, something like that. So. Um, not uncommon. I thought it might be a little higher, but uh, I think we have some savvy security uh, uh, professionals here in this room. So, uh, kudos. Okay. Try to figure out how to go back here. All right. Um, so, certainly the quickest way to the front page news now, except. Uh, coronavirus related is to have a major cyber breach, um, especially in the financial services um, uh, industry. Reputation risk is significant for a breach. Financial risk, there's compliance risk, operational risk, et cetera. Um, some recent studies from Ponemon, uh, Verizon, PwC, et cetera, have calculated the average uh, cost of a security breach is around $5 million per organization. I think some of these examples we have in here are, are well over that uh, from, a, from an impact and response uh, perspective. And we'll dive into these a bit, but um, you'll, see, you'll find a common thread is typically poor hygiene, poor security hygiene, uh, including things like vulnerabilities, misconfigurations, someone not doing something they should have or someone doing something that they shouldn't have. Not complicated things, but um, things that take a lot of work and a lot of diligence to ensure are done properly. We'll explore also a common theme or, or term called defense in depth. This is a, a, an industry term that's been circulating for, for many years, and essentially what it means is your control environment should include a variety of techniques, uh, technical solutions, people process um, to prevent incidents, to detect incidents, and then to correct. And we'll explore some of those uh, countermeasures at each one of those layers. So one of the recent uh, events, I think, uh, was widely publicized. It might have affected some of you folks in the room. Uh, Capital One, 106 million records exposed. Uh, this was little unique in that uh, Capital One made a lot of headlines because they were migrating most of their solutions to AWS. Um, so uh, certainly garnered a lot of attention. Was this a cloud-specific issue? Was this something unique to AWS, et cetera? Uh, there's been a lot of uh, research into how this happened. This was um, not unique to the cloud, but was back to the common common um, issue of poor hygiene, hygiene, so vulnerabilities in systems, applications being misconfigured, roles and permissions being too extensive, uh, lack of 
timely detection uh, and response. Uh, Capital One found out about it because the, the person uh, and, and other people in the community notified them. So it would have been interesting whether or not they found the breach if that didn't happen. Another incident over the past two years, three billion uh, records exposed. This was the Yahoo breach. Um, uh, this was through account compromise, uh, unauthorized access using weak uh, credentials. I think Yahoo's uh, improved their uh, uh, authorization mechanisms uh, since then. They have strong uh, multi-factor authentication, adaptive authentication as, as we call it, uh, which recognizes computers and behaviors and uh, uh, different characteristics about the user and steps up the authentication in that space. But this was one that existed for many months, was not widely detect, uh, or timely detected, uh, and uh, greatly impacted many users. And, and part of the problem with this is uh, a lot of people use their Yahoo account for uh, uh, logins to other websites. So not only did it expose Yahoo, but it exposed uh, other sites that also uh, users were using their login. Uh, uh, Yahoo login. Uh, one for us that kind of hit close to home this past December, Wawa, um, which is a gas station. I don't, don't believe they're here in Maine, but a uh, national uh, gas station fueling station had a point of sale breach. Uh, 30 million uh, rec records exposed. Um, malware got onto their point of sale systems and basically captured uh, transactions. Uh, inter interestingly, we, we've got a, a deep web, dark web monitoring service. Uh, they're now starting to see cards for sale on the dark web. Typical price is $15 to $20 for a credit card, a fuel card, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, many industries are targeted. Here's an example of the government industry, and there, there have been several in this space. OPM uh, had, had an incident uh, as well. Um, typically, weak authentication, lack of encryption, just poor hygiene. hygiene. Um, interestingly, we got a threat alert uh, from one of our threat intel feeds that, uh, in typical fashion, uh, in response to this uh, coronavirus outbreak, uh, malicious actors are, are targeting users with what look to be legitimate emails from the uh, World Health Organization or the C CDC or other federal agencies, really preying on the urgency, the panic of users and enticing them to click links, download files, divulge information, uh, et cetera. Uh, even donuts are not safe. Um, 20,000 users uh, impacted by uh, Dunkin' Donuts. And the reason I put this up there was just, I thought it was interesting that uh, something like this would, would be under attack. And, and often it's to harvest credentials that could be exploited on other sites. But uh, we, we see also in a lot of reward sites and point sites that uh, fraudsters and malicious actors are targeting them as well, not only to harvest credentials, steal identities, but also to steal points and rewards. So who are these threat actors? Uh, well, they're categorized into five main uh, threat actors, uh, organized crime, state-sponsored, malicious insiders, hacktivists, and terrorist organizations. We're going to dive into each one of these and kind of explore their motivations and techniques and talk about some of the countermeasures. Uh, so organized crime, this is one that impacts uh, the financial services industry quite extensively. They're motiv uh, motivated by financial gain. Uh, this could be a small group, it could even be lone wolf uh, people, or it could be well-funded organizations like the picture you see here. This is a, an actual um, organized crime unit that uh, was uh, where they're gathering evidence uh, and taking them down. But 
they're in office buildings and they're hiring people, you know, much like a regular organization. Uh, their techniques uh, typically are phishing, social engineering, uh, password attacks. You know, they're they're targeting users often, and they're, like I said, their primary motivation is financial gain. Um, in the fuel space, a little anecdote. So. Uh, in the U.S., EMV chips are very common now in the retail space, and fraudsters typically or historically attacked point-of-sale devices in the retail world. Uh, but now with EMV chips, uh, their attention is turning to other areas that are still leveraging mag stripes on their, on their cards. Uh, and most fueling stations in the U.S. do not accept chip cards. So uh, we, we are seeing, and the industry is seeing, um, actual fish, um, skimming happening on pumps where fraudsters are installing a, a Bluetooth-enabled device. You can hardly see it or detect it. Uh, you've seen them on ATM machines before, but on fueling stations. And they're in a nearby van, and they're capturing cards, um, and they're producing white plastic and uh, providing those to mules who are driving around in pickup trucks with fuel bladders and filling them up and then selling that fuel uh, at a discounted price. And some of these organizations are legit looking fueling organizations. Well, they'll, they'll go to construction sites and whatnot and look like a very legitimate fueling company offering discounted fuel. Um, 80 percent uh, right now of the cyber attacks are coming from organized crime rates. Um, I think the primary factor is because there's money in it, $445 billion annually and growing uh, due, to the, due to organized crime and uh, targeting financial services and other organizations. So money is quite the incentive. Another big threat actor are the nation states, the state sponsor. The biggest nation states targeting the U.S. are China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Uh, their, their motivations are, you know, varied, but typically espionage, political, economic, or military. Um, the techniques are a little more sophisticated, typically. They're, they might start with a spear phishing attack or social engineering, but they're really looking to uh, orchestrate what's referred to in the industry as an advanced persistent threat, where they establish a beachhead in an environment, um, use that beachhead for lateral movement in an organization, establish command and control communication back to to a site, and they're you know they're looking to steal information to disrupt the economy. Uh, certainly, military targets are are of interest uh, to these folks as well. Uh, recent examples, I think the Sony attack from a couple years ago uh, was widely attributed to North Korea. The Equifax breach uh, a year or two ago was, uh, I saw recently announced, attributed to the Chinese military. So these are very sophisticated, typically well-funded uh, organizations and capabilities that are, are targeting uh, private and public industry. Another category of threat actors that's on the rise are malicious insiders. Uh, these are folks, they may be employees or contractors or third parties, but they typically have credentials already uh, into your environment. They're, they may be seeking financial gain or retribution or revenge if, if they were you know, fired or demoted or not given a raise or, or whatever. Um, they, they typically are looking to exfiltrate data, whether it's IP data or uh, strategic information or something they can monetize. Um, some countermeasures in that space, certainly we're seeing a lot of organizations increase background checks. Um, management oversight is, is probably one of the most effective ones. You know, do you, do you as a manager know your employees, uh, know their behaviors and patterns? Are you in touch with their mood and their, their mindset. 
Um, but there are some technical solutions that a lot of organizations, uh, including WEX, are, are exploring. Things like DLP, which stands for Data Loss Prevention, um, looking for sensitive data that may be leaving your environment through a variety of ways. Could be email, could be through the web, uh, could be USB ports, uh, those types of things. So um, identifying, knowing what your sensitive data is for you or your organization, whether social security numbers, credit card numbers, uh, protected health information, other PII, and building filters and controls to detect and prevent that from leaving is, is one uh, pretty effective mitigating control. Um, we are doing, and a lot of companies are doing a lot in the privileged user management space. So these are the user accounts and insiders that can really cause the most damage, access the most information, um, and wreak havoc on your systems. So controlling access to those privileged users is a, a big focus. Now, there are solutions out there like credential vaults where you can put these privileged user accounts into a vault if someone needs to use them. There's a check-in, check-out process with approvals. The activities performed by, by those accounts uh, can be monitored and recorded, uh, much like a keystroke logger or video recording of what they actually did. Um, so we, we and others deploy those types of capabilities as well to really help lock down what privileged users can do in our environment. Um, there's also, you know, we've communicated to our employees, and I think it's pretty common, is there's really no expectation of privacy. These are, you know, you're using company assets and company net, company's network. You should expect that, you know, we're, we're going to monitor. You know, we have the capability to uh, read emails, to monitor what you're doing, et cetera. We, obviously, we allow incidental use of our systems for, you know, everyone, everyone needs to do something personal in nature, but um, it's pretty common that there's an expectation of no privacy uh, with a company asset. Uh, so hacktivists are the next uh, threat actor. Um, these are folks that are typically motiva motivated by a, a political reason, social activism, something ideological. They're, you know, rebels with a cause. Um, they are typically not affiliated with a government organization. They may you know, be in groups. Uh, the common, ones, common one was Anonymous, who was very famous for the last several years for wreaking havoc on a, a variety of different areas of industry, whether it's energy, Wall Street, banks, uh, et cetera. Uh, their typical techniques are denial of service. They want to disrupt or deface, uh, they want to interrupt uh, something that they don't believe in. Uh, in the energy space, uh, our clients, you know, the big big oil, are targets uh, frequently of hacktivists. So hacktivists can disrupt their ability to provide fuel. Um, they can come out and come after the payment providers, uh, folks like WEX. Um, so we see that as a as a significant threat as well. The last category of threat actors I have are the terrorist organizations. You know, these are the, the folks like ISIS and others uh, motivated by political or ideological reasons, sometimes financial gain, but uh, frequently propaganda, uh, espionage, uh, political, uh, et cetera. Um, their common techniques are defacements, sometimes claimed leaks, might not even be legitimate leaks, um, and disruptions. Disruptions to critical infrastructure, uh, electricity, power, water, supplies, government agencies, social services, uh, even you know financial services, banking, uh, government agencies, and military contractors. Um, again, the primary uh, mitigations for uh, the bad threat actors uh, that are terrorist organizations are you know, the common hygiene things we talked about, defense in depth cap capabilities, strong strong access controls, encryption, uh, not having vulnerabilities, having monitoring capabilities, alerting capabilities. Um, you know, I get asked a lot how do you prevent something, and it's typically not one answer. It's 
It's many layers of defense, many answers that, that make up a security posture and security program. And we're gonna dive into a little bit about what some of those are. The um, part of the challenge here is the attack surface is so large. Data is proliferated on many different types of devices, is accessible by many different types of devices, whether it's in public spaces or an employee's private network or your own company or through your third parties and, and business partners. Um, certainly the proliferation of Internet of Things uh, has expanded the attack surface. Uh, so the, the ability to implement security controls on a variety of uh, devices, systems, networks uh, that are distributed in, in nature, that are handheld or mobile, whatever, is very difficult. The common technique, rather than trying to control the device, is to protect the data. So encryption is probably the most effective way to ensure um, your data remains confidential. Um, but certainly this is a, a focus for, for all of us and there are a lot of solutions in the marketplace to uh, help uh, protect data, even on mobile devices, putting data into secure containers with encryption and uh, those types of things. The uh, common threat vectors, um, I think probably many of us know what these are. Um, social engineering, ransom mal ransomware, malware, uh, certainly weak passwords, distributed denial of service, um, which we'll dive into. Uh, web vulnerabilities are still very common. Um, and surprisingly, um, some, uh, a lot of risk still with lack of encryption. Um, most reputable websites, when you go to them, you'll, you'll see the HTTPS uh, encryption, but there are still some, some sites that are not leveraging that and or, or their internal networks do not have uh, any kind of internal network encryption or database encryption, storage encryption, uh, those types of things. So sort of that you know, Reese's Pieces uh, security model where you're hard and crunchy on the outside, but the inside is uh, very soft and gooey. Um, still, 91% uh, of cyber attacks start uh, with a phishing email. It's the most common vector of a cyber incident for malware, for divulging information, enticing people to click links, respond, do wire transfers, provide information, uh, et cetera. And uh, typically what they're after is a credential, uh, a, a way to log into systems to uh, gather additional information. A recent example of phishing that I think was very effective because it, um, it, it was timely. This was around the holiday season. Uh, phishing emails came out appearing to come from Chase that looked like very legitimate fraud alerts asking a user, do you recognize these transactions? And obviously, they're not legitimate transactions, so the user is going to be enticed to, to click no. I don't recognize these, and by clicking, well, they're going to uh, get some payload. It could be malware, um, it could be a, a, a spoofed DNS site that asks them to log in with their banking credentials or or uh, uh, credit card uh, information, and the fraudsters will use that information to conduct identity theft as well as uh, an attempt to monetize those cards and uh, conduct fraud. So I thought this one was unique in that it was pretty good. I mean, it looked legit, hard to detect, and it uh, preyed on the sort of the panic that a lot of us hear about, about uh, uh, fraudulent transactions and unauthorized credit card use. So some tips. 
certainly uh, don't divulge information. Limit what you respond with. Uh, in most cases, don't respond to emails. Don't click on the email link. Go back to the original site. Go back to your Bank of America and your Chase credit card sites and log in directly uh, through them. If, uh, if you get calls or texts, um, and no, no legitimate business or organization will need or ask for a user account or credential or card number. They know that. They should, you know, there's no reason for them to ask for that. So uh, we see that in what's called phishing, uh, which is voicemail phishing and uh, SMS phishing. Uh, but many techniques that fraudsters are trying to get users to divulge information. And, uh, and we're coming into tax season now. And IRS scams are very, very prevalent. The IRS will never ask for credentials, passwords, or sensitive information. So call them back if you need to, but don't don't uh, respond over the phone or email. Okay, so back to your phones. We're going to have another question. Let me hop over, hopefully. Do you regularly back up your devices at least once per month? And you'll see in a second why I'm asking. Okay to, okay to be honest. No one's gonna point you out if you don't do this. So we're running about 50-50 right now, 33 responding. Most of us on our phones use iCloud backup and those types of things, which is good. But what about your home PCs and Macs? So we're at about 56% do and 44% do not. That's not too surprising. The reason this is important is because one of the most common things we hear about right now are uh, ransomware. The biggest um, mitigation against ransomware um, beyond preventing it in the first place through malware and safe computing and uh, those types of capabilities, but is to have backups. And the common guidance and recommendation from the security community is to not pay ransom. Um, fraudsters will typically prey on uh, whether it's local governments or hospitals or other institutions that maybe don't have the best security controls or uh, it's very important that their systems become available quickly, um, will target uh, those folks extensively because they're more likely to, to pay ransom uh, rather than try to revert to backups. But certainly by having an effective backup, if you get ransomware, you're, you're much more likely to restore um, your, your data. So countermeasures around for ransomware, we talked about backups, but certainly maintaining a anti-malware, antivirus system, regular updates. Um, as an organization, educating your users uh, through constant messaging and awareness. At, uh, here we do actually an anti-phishing training campaign on a quarterly basis where we use a, a, a service to send what look like legitimate emails out to our user community, enticing them to click. If they do click, uh, click a link or attempt to download a file, it will pop up with an interactive training of, oops, what just happened? How can I stay off the hook uh, in the future? But it's good to continuously remind users to practice safe computing, to be skeptical, um, and also deploy some technical solutions like uh, proxy blocks, which prevents where users can go onto the internet. You can block certain categories and malicious sites. Um, and since a lot of phishing still happens by email, there are technical solutions around um, concepts like sandboxing, uh, emails that, that have links or attachments, as well as URL rewrites, which uh, is a service that will rewrite the URL in the email 
to validate that it's not malicious. Um, and then if it's not malicious, it will pass, pass the request back to the user that they can continue. A, another threat vector that's, um, that's pretty common, been in place for quite some time, are what's called distributed denial of service. Typically, the intent is to disrupt um, uh, an application or a network. Could be at different layers, could be at the network layer or the application layer, but generally, the fraudster, malicious actor is flooding your system with illegitimate requests to make legitimate requests more difficult to reach uh, the intended system. Um, typically, uh, the way these things work, will they'll have a botnet that's uh, looking for exploitable and vulnerable systems on the internet that can serve as zombies, uh, that they can orchestrate and target particular URLs or IP addresses or whatnot to, uh, to conduct their distributed denial of service. An interesting uh, anecdote, uh, I've seen this in the past where uh, malicious actors are targeting an application and they're exploiting a, a vulnerability and they're having some success. Um, when it's found and we fix it, um, they get angry and their next step is to orchestrate a denial of service attack against us. Um, so just an example of they have many techniques and when there's a lot of money involved with what they're doing and they're having some success exploiting a vulnerability and that's taken away, well, they, they get pretty angry. So tips for preventing denial of service. Um, uh, deploying a web application firewall has proven to be effective for application layer attacks. There are many types of WAFs uh, available, including cloud WAFs. And working with your internet service provider as an organization uh, helps a lot, and there are a lot of technical solutions and capabilities out there from uh, many different anti-DDoS uh, vendors to help manage uh, this risk. And part of your incident response should be how do we how do we handle how do we test for and how do we res respond to uh, distributed denial of service attacks? Moving along, another uh, common threat vector is through web applications. There's an organization called Open Web Application Security Project (OWASP) as it's referred to. They they publish uh, a top ten list of commonly exploited web applications. Um, it's remarkable how many applications have many of these vulnerabilities. Um, two common ones that we see frequently are SQL injection and cross-site scripting. Uh, these vulnerabilities allow attackers to uh, uh, enter data into forms that could be commands or functions that can then extract uh, other data out. So what's happening is the application is not validating the input data, meaning it's accepting any answer. It's, it's, maybe the right answer should be a one or a two, but it, it accepts any type of input and it uses that, the attackers use that misconfiguration basically to exfiltrate data or compromise the systems. So this is a big focus uh, for a lot of organizations how to how to prevent these application vulnerabilities. And, and probably the best technique is a concept of shifting left, shift security left into the development life cycle. Um, be involved in the planning architecture phases and the coding phases. Um, do static code analysis, for example, where you assess and analyze source code that developers are writing so that you can find vulnerabilities early prior to production deployment, it's much cheaper. Uh, much better security posture, um, et cetera. So in cloud environments or agile shops where you're doing continuous integration, continuous development, uh, have checkpoints and uh, capabilities uh, with your security team and security functions to uh, be involved in the development of products uh, throughout the life cycle. There's also 
what we call dynamic testing, more once an application or website is built, you know, coming at it, testing it from kind of the hacker perspective, um, using, you know, it could be commercial tools or techniques to really test dynamically the security defenses uh, of the application. Uh, and again, back to the WAF, so WAF's web application firewalls are, are common techniques to quickly mitigate source code vulnerabilities. It's certainly best to fix your source code and your apps and not have bugs and vulnerabilities, but uh, we also recognize that takes time. So if you can drop in a technical solution to help mitigate that risk of those vulnerabilities being exploited, then that's an effective mit mitigation as well. Uh, I mentioned lack of encryption. We still see this uh, quite a bit. Um, as a consumer, make sure when you go to websites that it's HTTPS, especially if you're doing any kind of credential exchange, moving money, doing, doing anything, anything uh, sensitive at all, make sure it's an HTTPS uh, site. The emails uh, are just not secure. Don't expect anything you send an email to, to be private, to be secure. It's easily intercepted, easily compromised. Uh, if you have something sensitive that needs to be shared, there are, there are secure email programs or, or encryption programs that can encrypt data uh, on your personal devices, laptops, uh, et cetera. Deploy a hard disk encryption. So if your laptop is stolen or lost, uh, you know it's, it's only worth the value of the, the hardware and none, none of the software or data on the system can be exposed because it's uh, encrypted. Okay, so we're gonna do our last um, audience question. And it's, do you use a common username and password across multiple sites? Running through, it's about 55% yes, 45% no. Pretty common. I think uh, a lot of us, for ease of use, use a, a common, common account and, and password. Uh, frankly, we can't remember uh, that many. So obviously, that represents risk. Uh, your account then is only as secure as the weakest uh, place that you are using it. So if you're using it on an insecure site, uh, then it's likely to be compromised. Uh, the next slide I have is Internet of Things related. Um, 80% of all devices with cloud and mobile app components uh, did not either have a password or it was not very secure, easily guessed. Uh, and 90% of those devices that are connected to the internet had some kind of personal information that an attacker could use. Um, the mitigations against this, obviously, for anything that you have at home on the internet, uh, configure to use encryption, that's typically a capability and, and most devices uh, use a strong credential that's not easily guessable. Um, upgrading the firmware to the extent you can regularly. Um, and make sure you use some sort of a home firewall, router, et cetera, that offers some kind of basic protection. A uh, grab this off. Uh, a research channel. These are 2000 or recent uh, weak passwords. So hopefully, we're not using these. These are you know, common, basic hygiene things that you'd be surprised at still how widely spread uh, these types of things are, are used. The default accounts and passwords not being changed. All basic things that are easy to do, 
Um, but again, back to the attack, attack surface, and it's extensive and varied. It uh, becomes problematic and difficult to manage. So what can, uh, what are some mitigations in that space? Uh, certainly, if you're a website operator or ensure that any organization or, or site that you're visiting, if it's sensitive in nature, make sure it uses some sort of a multi-factor um, concept I mentioned called adaptive auth, where it, adaptive authors authentication, where it, it, it identifies behaviors, characteristics about your computer, browser information, um, even things like how fast you move the mouse around and click, right? This, these are heuristics and machine learning capabilities that a lot of new software has that detects when something is abnormal, right? It creates a behavior about what a legitimate user is, what systems or what IP, IP addresses, geolocation, where they're coming from, et cetera, and creates that profile. And then if, if uh, someone else attempts to use that credential and doesn't meet those characteristics, it steps up authentication. Maybe it text requires you to enter a code, you know, a, a telephone number to get a code and enters that back. But uh, very common and very effective techniques to prevent uh, uh, credential compromise and, and cross-pollination of uh, what are common, commonly uh, you know, shared accounts and passwords. And certainly, you know, as an individual, you can use a secure wallet, you know, pretty effective on your on your phones, load your passwords and accounts into that. Into that. Um, at least it's in your, your information's in one place uh, and should be uh, tightly protected. Obviously, use passcodes and uh, the biometric capabilities on your devices are, are effective countermeasures uh, as well. Uh, so looking forward, uh, what's in store for 2020? So, you know, like I mentioned, there's not an easy answer uh, for cybersecurity. This is, it's, it's not complex, right? But it's very difficult to manage a variety of layers of controls. Um, basic security hygiene is still the best thing, similar to this virus issue we're having. You know, they say wash your hands. It's still the the most effective way to prevent infection. Well, it's pretty true in the security and technical space as well. Don't have vulnerabilities. Use strong passwords. Don't write down you know, sensitive information. Um, so we think these threats will continue to evolve. There's a lot of work, a lot of solutions right now that are leveraging machine learning and an artificial intelligence to, to um, have threat intel feeds, uh, compare that to actual activity data happening on your network. And because the volume is so extensive, it's impossible for humans to make sense of it. So we, we use services here that uh, leverage those types of capabilities. Uh, they do that heavy list, lifting for us where they analyze and correlate and aggregate our data across multiple uh, environments. and you know, weed it down into something that's actionable that we should investigate and respond to. Certainly with the emergence of 5G, I believe uh, someone's coming up to, to speak on 5G, but um, that's going to enable many more devices to be connected and to stay connected onto the Internet at all times. So uh, that you know, also, you know, increases the attack surface and the capabilities for uh, malicious actors to, to get in and establish uh, a beachhead and lateral movement and uh, look for data and look for credentials and, um, you know, like we say, motivated by different reasons, whether it's financial or espionage or defacement or whatever. Um, one more thing we're seeing a, a lot of are these something called deep fakes. Perhaps you've seen some of these videos. They're actually pretty sophisticated. That look like the legitimate, look like people talking or legitimate um, videos or messages, uh, but they're fake. Um, so in the social engineering phishing space, uh, we expect deep fakes 
you know, videos and messaging and those types of things will continue to expand uh, in the coming years. So it's going to be intense, but um, I think we're up to the challenge. Um, it just takes diligence, a lot of hard work, and we'll do our best to stay in front of it. But with that, okay, uh, I think there are, you can answer questions online or there are some questions online. I'm, okay, you can answer questions online or I guess, um, oh, okay, so we have some here online. Is there a free phishing test email service to send to users to see who click? Most of these services are subscription-based. Um, not aware of an effective one. There might be some demo trial versions uh, out there, um, but some of the big vendors in the space, FishMe, um, uh, Wombat, and some others uh, have the services, but I'm um, not sure of the free, free ones. Certainly you could Google search and try to find one, but certainly any industry commercial appropriate version would likely uh, not be free. Are the free password manager programs okay to use? Things like LastPass and others. Um, I think so for most personal use. Uh, probably not if you're a, a CIA operative or something, but for general home use, uh, I think some of these free password wallets are, are reasonably okay. And or some of the better ones are pretty cheap in the app store. Do I recommend a specific password manager? Uh, LastPass is one I'm most common or most familiar with, and I think it's pretty good. From a web browser, I particularly like Chrome, um, but again, it's maybe user preference and a VPN provider. So um, there are a lot of emerging uh, anonymizing VPNs. Uh, uh, that take advantage of poor networks and uh, those types of things. I, I think those are becoming more prevalent, but um, you know, I think for most users, having an effective home firewall, home router, uh, practicing safe computing, having antivirus, and using a, a common browser that's updated and patched regularly is is uh, is good enough. Do I recommend a site or service that offers custom quizzes for security knowledge? Uh, there are many um, in that space. A lot of vendors provide security awareness training. Uh, we use, we've used a few in the past, Media Solutions, Wombat, um, et cetera. Again, a, a Google search will reveal a lot, a lot of offerings in that space. Um, how do I move down? Forgive me here. Oh, how would I briefly describe or explain social engineering? Um, using non-sophisticated techniques to entice a user to divulge information. Uh, so it could be even dumpster diving, looking in your mailbox. Could be calling you on the phone, texting you, emails, um, establishing, uh, you know, a, a phone call to you, saying you're from the help desk, or you're from, you're from the bank, and your account's been breached, and we need your information, right? So non-technical techniques attacking a user is how I would describe social engineering. What are the most important skills for future cybersecurity employees to be equipped with? So there are many domains in cybersecurity. There, there's risk, there's architecture, engineering, uh, support, there's monitoring, incident response. So I'd say, you know, looking across large security organizations, you see a, a, a very diverse set of skills, um, psychology skills even, um, technical skills, risk skills. Um, certainly a lot of organizations are migrating to the cloud. So we and many other organizations are searching for cloud experience, people with AWS and Azure or Google. 
um, are, are very marketable and, and very high demand. How much time do I have? Okay, let me do one more question. That's several, several here. Several duplicates. Um, how do you get buy-in to staff appropriately? Or how do you get buy-in to uh, expend resources to address cybersecurity? So as an organization, uh, I report directly to our board of directors on a quarterly basis. And basically, I, I, I articulate the cyber risk in terms Mike, of a business. I want to do a back end yeah. uh, come there. Um, we're moving close to the break, break now, now, and we might go back to Mike if he has a few more comments. Um, the sound, the sound is still on, on according, according to, this, to this, and we've got a phone link in there as well. Believe you me, we've got four ways to get away from the moment, right? So, uh, here's, a here's a thought, thought. we're going to predict the future. What is, what is going, going to be, to be the big surprise? surprise? Is, is, is back? Oh, you want me? Hey, I shout loud. <laughs> okay, but for the recording. Um, from what we have learned today, what should you predict to be the big surprise cyber risk to you at home? your person and your organization for 2020. You've heard it here, join the dots. Sorry, students, you've heard that very often. Join the dots. All the evidence you need has been presented to you today. What's the big shocker of what's gonna hurt your bank account, your uh, well-being, your company, yourself, your family? What should worry you? Yes, sir. Your habits, yeah, habits are a problem. Yes, sir. The lack of encryption. Yeah, that's one. But what one is special this year? Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, um, oh ma'am, sorry. I, sorry. Yeah. Um, I was going to say ourselves because we want to do like protect ourselves. And in order to do that, yeah. That, these are all important ones, but I want you to think laterally. What's going to happen this year? Didn't happen last year. You couldn't have happened last year. Yes, sir. Our political system, the voting. Uh, we had that in 2016, census. right? Census. Or my refrigerator and coffee maker. US census. Refrigerator. Census. Give me another one. 5G still a little way away. The big one. Election. No. no. <laughs> yes, sir. No, AI. AI is one. Yes, these are all. But which is the one that is really the big deal for 2020. Yeah. Yes, sir. That wouldn't be the uh, uh, two-day year, would it? No, 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 not really. Okay, Thomas students, what am I doing? I'm playing evil, I'm playing uh, evil beard again, right? What could it be? How's about it? I'm going to give you a number. You're going to have to do math. 25 minus 6. 19, what's 19? COVID-19, you are gonna have scams, you're gonna have people selling you masks, you're gonna have people trying to sell you hand cleaner. You said it. <laughs> Sir, as I do with my students, I will walk to you and present my fingers for a smack. All right? We have a break. I... <laughs> okay. I have 12 important things for individuals and companies, and companies that they should think about after the break. Yep. I have four Thomas students that are going to give another 12. They didn't know it until I just told them, right? <laughs> and they graduate, so they can decline, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to have a break. We've got Ron Bernier to come in and talk to you about ransomware. And then we're going to go through to the panel, which is going to have some surprises and some fun. Thank you.
and ransomware comes in at a couple of hundred dollars and a couple of million dollars at the moment, so it applies to, to home positions, depending on what you do at home, small business and big business. We have uh, Ron Bernier from one of our supporting organizations who employs a lot of people from uh, uh, Thomas. Uh, Ron is uh, the director of Tyler Detect. In other words, I got to detect bad stuff, all right? And he heads that up at Tyler Technologies. Um, he's a um, cybersecurity premier service that he provides through his people and his organization, one of many services that come from Tyler Technology. And they provide a bigger picture detailing what ransomware is, how it works, the options available to avoid losses. Ransomware is a risk affecting everyone, including large organizations. The presentation reviews your options and your safety options to get around that. So it's not just, you know, the scary stuff like I was talking about. This is getting into solutions, right? Ron Bernier. So, thank you. That's yours. That's fine. Yeah, you can Let me get out. Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Ron Bernier. How many people have been, uh, just show of hands, how many, been people, how many people have been thinking of the word elephant <laughs> since I came in? Right? Okay. So you now belong to one of four groups of people. Number one, you got hung up, hung up on the fact that I said good morning and you missed part of what I just said. Number two, you can't get the image of an elephant out of your mind. Number three, you'd like to know what planet I came here from. Or number four, you've actually paid attention and not been distracted by anything, and you, unfortunately, are the severe minority. It only takes one person, if we were an organization, one person to get distracted for the right amount of time um, to encrypt your entire network. Um, it doesn't happen that quickly, luckily, and we're going to talk about that. I am going to try to fit a 60-minute uh, cybersecurity presentation into 30, okay? My cybersecurity presentations normally do not stand behind a podium because I'm French, I talk with my hands, I like to move a lot. This is basically 60 minutes of stand-up with some cybersecurity built in. All right, so who am I? I'm Ron Bernier, I'm the director of Tyler Detect, uh, formerly known as uh, Discovery. I uh, helped to found a company called Sage Data Security. We were acquired by Tyler in uh, May of 2018. So we went from 50 people to 7,000 people, and for some of our uh, introverted employees, since cybersecurity people tend to be introverted, uh, that was a little bit of culture shock. I uh, spent 15 years in IT, um, working for community banks, uh, regional banks, national banks, and international banks. And I've worked technically, I guess, now for 20 plus years in cybersecurity. My email address is up there, you'll have all this stuff later. Uh, my Twitter feed is awesome because I probably haven't uh, tweeted since the last time the Dow was 21,000. Oh, shoot. That's happened again. Yes, do not look. All right, today's session, we're gonna talk about the ransomware threat, talk about some different families. Um, it's not just you know one person creating all the ransomware. We're gonna talk about the process, and that is the process from beginning to end for a ransomware infection, and we're gonna talk about the places where what my team does, which is called threat hunting, allows us to detect these infections that other automated systems can't and preserve um, client data. We're gonna talk about briefly about the costs and then hopefully some quick wins for your security posture. I apologize, some of it may be duplicated based on the last presentation I just saw, but that's okay. All right, three definitions, technically four, I guess. Malware, right? Malware is short for malicious software. It is software that is intended to do harm to your PC intentionally, okay? The key word there is intentionally. Microsoft Windows, therefore, by the def definition, is not malware, because they didn't intend <laughs> to do it, okay? Botnets and command and control servers. A botnet is basically what a hacker, uh, when he infects your, he or she infects your device, and he, can con he or she can control it, it becomes a bot, and a botnet is a group of these, okay? Typically, hackers will get your device infected, add it to their bot, and then they will resell access to that device. Most, and through all of this presentation here, I'm talking in general terms about what I call commodity ransomware, which is opportunistic and you were not targeted 
and this is generally how it operates, okay? So your botnet, uh, the hacker's botnet, is all of the PCs that they can control, and they do this via command and control server. Now, some stand up their own server. Um, usually it's internationally. Sometimes it can be an AWS to distract people, et cetera. Um, but, and it's used to issue commands to their bots, okay? So again, if the hacker is going to resale access to a device, um, maybe they infect a device at Bank of America, that could have a higher value to somebody trying to do financial fraud. Okay, so they're able to sell that. They issue the commands via command and control. The interesting thing is Twitter can be used for more than tracking the Kardashians. It can actually be used for command and control. So what happens is the software checks into a particular Twitter feed, reads the tweets, and based on the contents of that tweet, actually performs commands. Okay? Um, in fact, we've not, we personally, not my team, but we've found uh, as a cybersecurity industry that oddly enough, hackers have been using uh, Microsoft support forums for command and control as well. Ransomware, okay, is a type of malware. All right, it's a subset of malware. Ransomware's basic goal is to uh, prevent you from accessing your data. It does what's called encryption, okay? Normally, encryption is good. You talk to Amazon.com when you're going to order something and send your credit card. You don't want other people to get access to that. Encryption is bad when people do it to your data so you can't access it until you get what's called a decryption key. Okay? We're going to talk about, a little bit about the process here in a minute. So this is not a map of COVID-19 infections in the U.S. All right? This is a map of only the reported uh, public sector ransomware infections uh, over the last, I don't know, it's 12 to 18 months, okay? Um, as you can see, it's a problem. And I say reported because in my personal estimation, probably 10% of ransomware infections get reported these days, even from companies that are legally, regulatorily required to disclose, okay? All right, this is not who we're up against. Okay, this was me back in high school. No, I'm just kidding. My mullet was much better than that. This is what we're up against, okay? Essentially organized crime. These ransomware families have managers, they have executives, they have investors, they have marketing folks, they have customer support folks, just like normal businesses. Okay, this is what we're up against. This is not that hacker uh, sitting and sleeping in their parents' basement. So what types of families are there? Okay, again, these are a number of different groups, and this is a, just a very small sample. Uh, one interesting one here that we're going to talk about on the next slide, the Mays family. Uh, Mays is a type of ransomware that's used. Um, it was used in the Pensacola, Florida attack. Okay, which happened, what, two days before uh, the shooting on uh, the Naval Air Base. Uh, they actually came out on the internet, apologized for the timing of the incident, so that, you know, and saying that they were not at all associated, you know, with the shooting. So criminals sometimes do have morals, okay? But they're still going to want your money. And we're going to talk about one particularly uh, vicious change that they've made here in just a second. Um, typically though, if you look at all of these different families and you can Google them to find out exactly what they do, typically they work with other malware. Okay, our goal in Tyler Detect is to detect the original infection. Okay, just to give you a, a 60 second overview of what we do to detect malware. We scan an entire Windows Active Directory domain every 15 minutes and we pull what's called every, every new persistence mechanism. Okay, a persistence mechanism is something like a Windows service, a scheduled task, use of the run key. Okay, literally we're confirming every single persistence mechanism. Why do we do that? Because uh, ransomware and malware typically wants to survive a reboot. Okay, you have all sorts of legitimate persistence mechanisms on your PCs, things that load when your Windows device boots, things that load when you log in. Okay, not every new persistence mechanism is malicious, but every malicious persistence mechanism is new. So we actually have an analyst that confirms every single new 
persistence mechanism. It sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. Oddly enough, it is. But we get through it. Three, three major changes um, in ransomware lately that kind of changes, um, changes the game, so to speak. Um, the Ryuk family decided that uh, encrypting data, especially very large files, was just too slow. And if they can encrypt part of the file, they essentially eliminate your access to all of that file. So they encrypt the first 54 meg, okay? It's like, okay, so we lose 54 meg. And typically you're gonna lose actually the whole file, all right? Keeping in mind that when, you try, when you're trying to recover from ransomware and you don't have good backups, when you actually have to pay the hacker to get those keys to get your uh, data back, you're only gonna get about 90% back. And with this technique, it severely decreases your chances of getting that data back. Now, the, the biggest problem about that is your large files are typically your exchange stores, your email stores, right, your databases, all of your other critical data. Um, some of the, the Snatch family decided they reboot in safe mode. So when a device typically reboots in safe mode, most people choose reboot without networking. So that device is now isolated from the network and is allowed to continue to do their encryption without detection. And we're gonna talk about the phases where we can detect that. And finally, the Maze family, again, getting back to that uh, Pensacola attack. Uh, before they started doing this, ransomware never exfiltrated data. The key to data exfiltration is breach notification, right? Um, most organizations, um, in fact, HIPAA with um, healthcare, unless you can prove that there was no data exfiltrated, you have to disclose it regulatory wise. Um, when they started exfiltrating data, it doesn't matter if you have backups. It doesn't matter if you can restore your entire network. It doesn't matter that you don't need to pay the hackers. They're still going to make you pay because they're going to threaten to publish your data on a public website. And if you don't disclose, and then they disclose this, uh, various regulators are probably going to come visit. Okay, so if you're... Uh, a member of uh, IT organizations, um, then you're gonna wanna know if, if you're up against uh, a ransomware that will exfiltrate data. All right, six steps. Trying to make sure I'm still on time. The six steps of a ransomware infection. Okay, the first thing they do is a campaign, typically phishing, right? Phishing is uh, typically an email trying to distract you, like you were all distracted earlier by my good morning, by my use of the word elephant, etc., to get you distracted so you can uh, install their malware, okay? Typically, it's either a malicious document that's attached to an email, says, hey, here's your invoice, sorry about the billing mix-up, just fill this out and you'll get your refund. Or it's a, a link in an email, right? Looks like Amazon sent you something, uh, needs to do a refund, right? Uh, that link is in blue. And if you're here from an I, if you're part of an IT organization, you can think of at least one person in every uh, company you've ever worked for that if it is blue, and it is underlined, it must be clicked. Because purple is technically more soothing than blue, and I'm actually gonna to touch on that in a second. But anyway, the second step is infection. All right, we clicked on the link. Let's just assume, and none of us, nobody in here would ever do this, right? You click on the link, okay? And the code starts to execute. The code needs to, uh, bypass your antivirus, bypass your intrusion detection system, bypass all of your software controls, and the last control is the human mind, okay? Um, and again, earlier when I did the good morning thing, you were distracted, and you need to try to not be distracted in your busy uh, work life and home life so that you don't get infected. The code starts to execute, and then it does what's called staging. Staging is when it creates that persistence that persistence mechanism. So even if you power off your PC, even if you reboot the system, that ransomware is gonna to continue to execute on that reboot, okay? This is where the clock starts ticking for my team, right? At this point, the persistence mechanism is created. We're gonna collect that information. We're gonna to start to research that and we're gonna notify the client if it's malicious, okay? Literally for every single one. We have some time, most people think, uh, when, when the screen pops up, right, that I got infected and I need to pay money, most people think that that happens instantly and it typically doesn't, okay? The first stage that gives us some time to detect this is the scanning phase. 
It looks at your local drives, it looks at your cloud storage, it looks at your network. It may look at just the drives that you have mapped on your network. It may also scan your network for all sorts of file shares that it can encrypt. Obviously, this takes a little time, all right? The next stage, encryption, even takes longer, all right? Um, what happens is the local data, right? It's uh, you've got infected, it's connected out to the command and control server, and it's got what the encryption key. That uses it to encrypt, basically make gibberish of your data, okay? Encryption is a highly complex mathematical calculation that takes ones and zeros from your data and turns it into other ones and zeros that your software can't understand, okay? The only way to recover from that is to restore your files from tape or whatever your backups are or pay the ransom, okay? Encrypts the local files, it starts working on the network shares. If you work in IT, especially if you work on the help desk and you start getting calls from, hey, I'm trying to access this file and it won't open, right? That's not typically going to be ransomware. Usually it's that ID10T error, and some of you get that one. Um, but it can be, right? The cool thing that the hackers started doing um, before, when they started encrypting network data, you could go out to one of the encrypted files, right click on it, choose properties, and see who the data, the owner of that file was. They're the infected person. That's the infected device. Became very easy to find. So what did the hackers do? No, we're not gonna make it that easy for you. Now they're always administrator. Doesn't really help, okay? So this encryption takes quite a long, quite a long time, and eventually we get to the point where you're infected and you get displayed a screen. Typically it has a time urgency to it, usually 72 to 96 hours, okay, to pay in Bitcoin. How many people already have a Bitcoin account set up? How many businesses already have a Bitcoin account set up? Aha! You can't establish a legitimate Bitcoin account to pay the type of ransom in the amount of time uh, from the time you're infected till the time the hackers want to get paid. We worked with a large distribution company in the state. They were not a client of ours before the infection. Um, but we had to work from Joey in Colorado to be able to pay the hackers. Joey wants his cut, right? Bitcoin was going for, I don't know, let's say $10,000 a Bitcoin at the time. Eh, Joey's got a guy that he can do it for 10,500, okay? So even when you are dealing with criminals, you're dealing with criminals, okay? All right, so I talked a little bit earlier, I mentioned that we do what's called threat hunting, okay? If you think of the um, threat spectrum, the threats that you are facing as the equivalent of the visible spectrum, okay? Things that get caught on the left-hand side where the purples are, remember I said blue? Purple is more soothing than blue, right? Purple, that's why people click stuff, is the easiest stuff to detect. These are the threats that firewalls can block, okay? You get infected, um, the device needs to talk out over a weird port, to the command and control, odds are you have a, what's called an access control list, an ACL on the firewall that's gonna block that traffic. Okay, very simple, rudimentary control, but sometimes it works. You have antivirus and anti-malware. One thing I've learned by going out to RSA is the cybersecurity industry does one thing really, really well, marketing, okay? Second generation antivirus. Anybody want to take a guess at what second generation does versus first generation? Marketing. I'm going to get emails on that one from all of the antivirus vendors. These, these are the easiest things to detect. These are your, your less risky attackers, okay? Once you start bypassing firewalls and antivirus and anti-malware, you get into IDS IPS, which is intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems, okay? These are basically devices that not only can see uh, at a host level, but from a network level, in theory, can open up packets, even encrypted packets in some instances, and try to determine what's going on and whether this is malicious or not, okay? Uh, they use artificial intelligence, AI. They use machine learning, ML. They use behavioral analysis. But the hackers can still test against all of these systems because they can either buy it on the black market, they can test against it if it's software, 
And if, God forbid, they actually have to buy a legitimate copy or a legitimate piece of uh, hardware, they'll do that too. Okay? So the threats that we deal with are over on the far right-hand side. These are the reds. These are the more serious threats. If something gets to the point where we're researching it, every single control on the left, uh, to the left of it has failed. If you think of every major reported breach in the history of mankind that is software slash malware related, all those companies, they had all those controls on the left-hand side. But odds are they didn't have people paying attention to actually what's going on, right? Almost every organization will allow port 80 and port 443 outbound. Port 80 is HTTP and 443 is HTTPS. That's web browsing. Guess what protocols the hackers typically use to communicate to their command and control, HTTP and HTTPS. We're going to talk about one control, hopefully, time permitting, um, that you can use that's really going to block about 80 to 90% of that threat right out of the gate. But we do threat hunting. We are looking at the reds, those visible things that are malicious, as well as the infrared, things that are invisible. Obviously, they're not invisible, right? We do what's called log review, okay? At least it was called log review when Sari hired me in 2006 to do this, okay? We don't call it log review anymore. We call it threat hunting. Any ideas why? Because, right, because you can't hire people to do log review. <laughs> but threat hunting. Threat hunting. Hope none of my employees see that part of the presentation. $1.4 billion in ransom, ransom demands. That's not the cost. Paying the ransom is not the cost. Right? Baltimore, city of Baltimore got infected. Uh, their ransom, the hackers wanted $72,000. It's cost them over $18 million because they didn't want to pay the ransom. It's the downtime. It's the Red Bull and pizza that your IT staff need to get your systems back up and running. $9.29 billion, right? I need to order, I need to own a pizza joint or a Red Bull factory or I guess today a toilet paper company. <laughs> All right, I've got about five minutes left so I'm going to breeze through these relatively quickly. I, I take all six of these very seriously because you can literally eliminate maybe 95% of your threats, uh, especially at a company with just these six simple uh, techniques. When I started in information security about 20 years ago, I worked at Skowhegan Savings Bank. The two biggest threats that we faced were bad passwords and patching. And guess what my first two recommendations are? Have better passwords and patch. <laughs> 20 years later. Never use the same password on two or more accounts. That means never use a password on more than one account. Every password should be unique, all right? I take it to extremes. All of my usernames are unique, well, at least the usernames that I created since I got into cybersecurity. All of my usernames are randomly created eight characters. All of my passwords are randomly created 14 characters. My mother's maiden name is Because all of my security questions, the answers to them are random eight character answers. Makes it tough when I call the bank and they ask me, I'm like, <laughs> but that's why you use a password manager, right? She was from the Eastern Europe. Try to, you try to pronounce it is what I always say, right? Um, admin and standard, if you are, you should never be logging in interactively to do a device as an administrator. Always log in as a standard user and then elevate your privileges to do what you need to do as that admin. Always, always. Uh, never use company passwords for personal accounts and vice versa. If your company gets infected, do you want your own personal accounts to get breached as well? No. And if your personal stuff gets compromised, do you want to you know, open your company up to something? Eh, maybe you don't like the company you work for. But still. <laughs> So avoid reusing the same username as well if you can, all right? Patch. 20 years and we're still having trouble patching. Why? Patch your desktops, your servers, your firewalls, your mobile devices, right? Your phones, patch your phones, your switches, your routers, patch everything. Test, please, before you patch. Because you don't want to have to explain to an executive in your organization, I just didn't want to get us infected with ransomware doesn't fly, okay? Test before patching, and then patch in batches. 
Don't patch the entire organization at once. Patch some test PCs. They're usually the IT PCs. Why? Because we, they're ours and we know how to fix them, right? Uh, earlier I saw a slide. It's the only slide that I saw before the 2020 predictions and I really wish I had been in here for that, that part. But anyway, enable multi-factor authentication. I don't care what it takes for your organization. Argue for this, okay? We had a major uh, healthcare organization that had their IS staff had tried for years to get multi-factor authentication enabled. Couldn't get, it, couldn't get it done, right? Politics being what they are within a company, it's tough to do, okay? Um, they finally got it, finally got their executives to buy in. Why? Because one of the executives' email accounts got compromised. <laughs> Just saying. Don't go and like change your executive password to something that you can then hack. That's not what I'm saying. Um, it is relatively simple. It's relatively cheap or maybe free. Google Authenticator, eh, you might want to pay for one, but it's there. There will be political fallout. You need the support from the top. You need it from your executives. You need to understand, the, the executives need to understand that if they suffer a breach, their stock could plummet. Oh, well, not as much as it has in the past 10 days, but it could still plummet. Weigh the risk in super critical areas. We work a lot now with public sector. 911 networks should be on their own and you sh they, they, maybe they don't have to have multi-factor authentication. There's a study that's been done, I forget where I found it, so I could just be making this up. Healthcare uh, hospitals that have multi-factor authentication enabled have a higher mortality rate in the emergency room. And that actually is true. You can look it up, as they say. Um, so, you know, if you're in one of those emergency rooms, and they say they don't have multi-factor uh, authentication, sure, that's great if they do, maybe tell them to take you to the other hospital. All right, the one thing that you can do uh, that will block almost all threats, if you have a web proxy, that you proxy all of your web browsing through your organization, block the category called typically unrated, unknown, uncategorized. This is the new, these are the new domains and new hosts that your web proxy company hasn't visited and classified yet because people actually do that, right? So if it's a new website, yeah, maybe it's not malicious, but as I said earlier, everything malicious is new. So block that. Um, oddly enough, block the malicious categories, including phishing, malicious websites. We had a couple clients that came on and we were looking through their proxy logs on day one and they were allowing malicious websites. Pretty easy control. You can probably get buy-in for that one pretty quickly. Advocate for blocking the immoral for security purposes. Don't argue it from an immoral standpoint and what you believe. Argue because it's a security risk. Segment your networks. Your emergency services should not be on your corporate networks and people answering 911 calls should not be checking their email and going out to Amazon. Thank you. All right, segment those networks. Give them two devices if you have to. Students should not be on, students and guests should not be on the same network as your corporate. If you work for a school here, for example, and I hope that you guys aren't set up this way, your students should be on their own network. Evaluating and looking for anomalies in a student network is essentially the same as looking for anomalies in random traffic. It's not easy to do. Plus, the, the school typically does not have authority over that device. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. On-site vendors. We had a vendor bring a device onto one of our client's networks and it triggered our Conficker signature. Conficker is from what, 2008? We're like, that's gotta be a false positive. No, it wasn't. Isolate your vendors. If you have an email gateway, Modify your inbound emails to remind your employees after you've done the extensive training of teaching them how not to click on things, give them this reminder. And this was a sample that uh, thomas.edu uh, uses. The email originated from an external source. Don't trust it. Here's a little hint. If you email me and you get a response from me and it doesn't, and I'm sorry, and if it does have proper punctuation, it's not me. <laughs> I use three periods, otherwise known as the ellipsis, 
I use three question marks. I use three exclamation marks. I get really excited sometimes. You will always see three. Every time I send an email to our marketing group, say, can you approve this for sending? They always come, it always comes back with the single punctuation. Then I change it and send it out. <laughs> that was a whirlwind. I get that. Questions? Yes? Sure, as long as they like dad jokes. <laughs> and if you can give me an hour, seriously, that, that's better. No offense, Frank, I just, I have a lot of jokes that I didn't get a chance to work in. <laughs> yes? Uh, you said turn on two-factor. What about teachers who never log off their machine? Ah. <laughs> really? Yeah. Seriously? I work at school, too. Yeah, yeah. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> it's not easy, it's not easy. Um, you can force logouts, right? You can use uh, uh, log on time restrictions. Um, and I haven't been an admin for a long time, but back in my day, which is a long time ago, um, you could force a logout. I don't know if you can still do that now. But it not only disconnects them and doesn't allow them to authenticate, but it actually logs them out. You can always do what I used to do and just schedule a reboot task on their device. <laughs> yes? Um, it's valuable. Um, it's another software control. It's useful. All of those controls that I poke fun at, they are useful. It's just that they're not 100% accurate. Um, and that's why, you know, my team, we look at what actually happened. You know, one of the cool things that we do is every single new host that's visited on the internet by any of our clients gets researched. Every single new domain, I'm sorry, every single domain gets their who is registration checked and anything that's new in the past seven days gets researched. You know why? Because even though, let's say Microsoft.com was fine before, its domain registration can lapse, and it did, um, and somebody could use it for malicious purposes. So yeah, OpenDNS, similar services is great. It, there's no silver bullet, right? Uh, Richard Baitlick, and I'm sorry I'm going over on time, uh, but I, I don't care, no offense, Frank. Um, <laughs> Richard Baylook is a noted uh, threat hunting uh, network, NSM, whatever the S, network security management. Um, prevention eventually fails, detection eventually succeeds. So my group looks at things not only in real time, um, trying to make decisions on whether it's malicious, but also the next day in, in context, which is where you find some of the more sophisticated attacks. So yes, OpenDNS works great, but it, nothing's foolproof. Yes? Do you have any... Uh It's typically in minutes to hours. Um, and mathematically, just statistically speaking, um, from infection to notification to our SOC to verification and confirmation is less than 22 and a half minutes. Um, so we typically, knock on wood, none of our clients have lost, you know, got to that payday portion. We've been able to, to detect the infections. It can be done, um, even, you know, we don't do anything that anybody can't do for themselves. You just need to be able to do it in mass uh, scale. Right. I've got some more speakers to go here. We can do some more questions at five if you're available. I actually am not, so I apologize. All right, but I'm, they can get you email. I'm in hard, yes. Uh, feel free to email me um, anytime, any questions. If you're looking for bad stand-up routines, I am your man. <laughs> all right, thank you all. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. All right, so uh, I have four gentlemen that are gonna come up here. We have a slight change in program. Um, we, one of our backups didn't work well, so we are going to give a bonus presentation only on the web on our rebroadcast of, as of Monday. Uh, Jacob Gregoire from Wix, uh, because of the Wix travel, what gave us a PowerPoint, didn't work well, and we thought we we're going to use backup plan too, but you're not going to lose out because you're going to get the link, and the link will give you everything. So you get a bonus, and we don't charge you extra, all right? Um, in fact, you could grab some teas or something on the way out, but right now I've got four gentlemen if you'd like to come up because we've pulled in uh, under, uh, 
Hunter Quinlan to join us. If you'd like to come up, gentlemen, you've got some seats there. We'll take it from there. And we're going to introduce you one by one as you present for seven minutes, right? So I have uh, one person up here, and they, uh, according to uh, first name, and we have <laughs> Dash Albright. Uh, Dash, you're number one, as you normally are and were in class. Uh, Dash comes from uh, Saki, just up the road in Skarhegan. And give us a little bit. I know you're an engineer too, and that, uh, <coughs> what is engineering and all of that stuff, right? Yeah, so I am a uh, senior network engineer at SAPI North America and so in this Cowhegan plant. Um, <clears throat> so what that means is I manage uh, and take care of basically all the networking equipment at that site. So we, that's switches, access points, routers, firewalls, etc. So I uh, got my bachelor's degree here at Thomas. I uh, graduated in 2015 uh, with a computer science degree. Came back last year at the beginning of the cybersecurity master's program. Completed the program in the in that first year, and uh, here I am. So, I'm going to talk about network security, um, ranging from small business to large. The idea is, you know, this can hit home with really you guys at home, small businesses who right now maybe don't have exactly what they want to have, uh, schools who maybe not don't have the protections in place that they should, um, and really the concepts, the core concepts should be implemented from, again, small business up to large. So that's why I'm including that large business category here. So there's some uh, basic risks in the networking communication segment. So I'm going to talk about some of those risk areas and the associated controls that may be valuable in those areas. <clears throat> so first thing being uh, in our networking systems, this is going to be the actual area that connects your devices together. Uh, and there we're going to talk about firewalls, intrusion detection. We've heard a little bit about that, intrusion protection and that physical segmentation or even virtual segmentation. Again, uh, this is going to be one of the core things we talk about. A couple other things worth mentioning that I don't dive into uh, as deeply, but I think it's important for you guys to keep, uh, keep in mind is uh, data replication and backup. So we talked a lot about backups. Do you back up your stuff, personal, business, otherwise? Um, you know, and, and it's more than just backing up that data. Junk backups, you need quality backups and also that you know how to handle situations when you need to use those backups. Um, vendor access, I think, is really important. Um, whether you're a small business or a large business or a school, you cannot do everything in-house. You're going to have vendors who are selling you things and asking to configure things for you. So you need to be prepared to vet those, those vendors, and you need to have systems in place so that those vendors have access control, you monitor what they're doing, and you log what they're doing. So if they mess things up, you have, you have record of it. That's critical stuff. Um, outsourcing is similar as well. You know, um, if you have to hire contractors, you want to follow a lot of those same, same concepts, concepts as if you have a vendor in your uh, business. Even in-house users, you know, even if you're a small shop of five people, you want to make sure that everyone is only given the access that they need. This is called least privilege. We've heard a, lot, a couple other people talk about it, and uh, it's critical. Uh, more for larger business, we're going to talk about operational data. So we're talking about log correlation and alarming. People heard of Splunk usually, so you're going to, that's going to be where you put all your logs in a central location. You can search all those logs, you can alarm on the data, and you can uh, alert and tell people that stuff's going wrong. So I'm going to get right into it and talk about some secure networking. Uh, it says layer two up there. It's a little bit more than, a little bit beyond that as well, but First concept, this is really low level stuff guys and that's using VLANs. So if you've got multiple different types of devices in your environment, you should do your best to segment those. And we've heard about that a little bit uh, today already, but you can use VLANs on most managed switches that I've ever heard of, you can use VLANs, right? So what a VLAN does is it takes one physical piece of equipment called a switch and it makes it so you can have every single port on that switch be in a separate network if you wanted to, and that's VLANs. Um, more critical stuff, you know, your critical infrastructure, healthcare maybe like we have heard about in the past, you may want to completely physically segregate those networks. Um, and then again, subnetting here is really what's beyond layer two, but it really ties a lot in with VLANs. So what you can do with a network implementation is you can set up a network to be the exact size it needs to be. So if you have 32 cameras, 
or that's a bad example, but if you have 32 devices, roughly, you want to size that network to accommodate that exact amount of devices. That's the idea of subnetting, and, and typically what you're going to have is um, a VLAN set up for a specific type of device, and you're going to size your network appropriately to accommodate what you expect to need now and prepare to expand that if you need to in the future. And then really low level here is port security, and again, all managed switches can do this. It's a feature that switches can do, and what you can configure is each port can only be used for this one single MAC address. Every device you plug into the network has a MAC address, and this is real low-level stuff, but it's going to prevent you from being able to have someone go unplug a computer that's out in the field and plug in theirs. It's going to shut down the port. Really simple stuff. Makes a huge difference in practice. Uh, secure networking beyond that, we're going to talk about ACLs. Again, we've heard a little bit about that today. And firewalls, this is that purple stuff that we just heard about that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, right? Um, so layer three access control list. You know, you can have a router at home that's going to be able to implement ACL. You can have routers in small business, large business. They can all limit your traffic in one way or another. You can allow addresses to communicate with other addresses between your networks. Um, but they're a little bit harder to configure. You know, it's a lot of command line stuff in most, most environments and you can do a little bit less with it. And that's where we get into the firewall world. Uh, with firewalls, it's easier to configure typically and it's a lot more granular. So you can specify each specific address between your two separate networks that need to be able to talk to one another. So uh, again, this is simple stuff, but it's really, really critical that you at least have these base level fund fundamentals in place um, before you move on and get into the more advanced stuff. Um, so this is a really, really basic example, but for a small business is critical and it's even worth thinking about, um, you know, for things like schools. So uh, what I've got is an example network up here um, with five separate, um, we'll call them subnets, um, five separate networks, we'll say. So we're going to have a guest wireless network, an internal wireless network, uh, a LAN, a local area network for physical computers, a uh, LAN for camera systems and a LAN for company servers. So the idea being internally we want to seg segregate these devices using that segmentation VLANs. Um, we put the firewall in place so that that firewall is the device that either allows or denies traffic between your networks. Again, really simple example here, but if you have guest wireless at your small business, you don't want that guest wireless to be able to talk to any of your internal devices. Okay. So you're okay with unfettered access to the internet for your customers, um, but you're not okay with that guest internet access, guest wireless access touching any of your internal devices. Basic idea. Um, now, beyond that, we got our internal devices. And again, in reality, you may limit your connectivity between your internal wireless your company, and your company computers. You may limit your access to your servers, et cetera. But the idea here is, again, the internet access in this environment is going to be um, limited. We're going to have some protections in place between our internal devices we care more about and that actual internet connectivity. Um, and we're not going to allow any connectivity to that guest wireless network because we don't want um, Joe from down the street coming into our shop, connecting to our wireless, and infecting us. So this is all really relevant for you know even our homes, right? So. We've heard people talk about home routers, uh, how we would set up our homes, things like that. Well, the good news is most people have a modem at home that their internet service provider gave them or charges you 10 bucks a month for because, you know, robbery. Um, or some people, maybe worse, get a combination modem router from their internet service provider that gives them wireless. It's great. Um, what that means is you don't have any kind of access to configure or change things on that device. So if you've been offered that, you maybe want to think twice, spend less money uh, monthly, and uh, maybe go buy yourself an actual home router. Um, so what the home router actually provides you is typically going to be your wireless, your firewall, um, and your routing. And honestly, most people use it as a switch, too, because you're actually plugging your devices into it. But this all-in-one device does give you some sort of protection that in a company-based environment usually isn't enough. And you're going to want seg separate devices that are purpose-built to serve as switching firewalls, routers, et cetera. Thank you. Um, last thing I want to talk about is intrusion detection and intrusion prevention. 
So again, we've again heard these, heard these buzzwords. The big thing I want to keep in your mind is both of them, good systems, good to have them. Just think intrusion detection, you're, in, you're detecting when it's already happened. It's reactive in nature. In nature. Intrusion prevention is proactive in nature. You're trying to actively prevent um, those intrusions. So um, again, not super crazy things, but really nice to have. And you maybe want to consider having both if you're going to have either. So thank you. Oh, thank you, guys. Uh, it's not that Jason can't do that. He's up next. It's just that I know where everything is. <laughs> And I can get the stuff rolling. Uh, we're going to hit that, we're going to hit that, and it'll be there. All so right. over here we've got Jason Rushing, um, uh, who is a senior director at Main uh, Health uh, Medical Center, is another name that you'll hear. I always get confused between those. And he's in operations and analytics and other complicated stuff, and he's going to go and throw five Gs at you. Thank you. <laughs> so I consider myself a pretty quick learner. So uh, my plan is if my presentation starts to bomb, I'm going to shout, good morning, elephants, and bolt for the door while you're all distracted. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Jason Rushing. I'm the Senior Director of Data Operations and Analytics at Maine Health Accountable Care Organization. Um, I'm going to give you a presentation about 5G opportunities and risks. So a little bit about me. I was born and raised in Southern Illinois, joined the Navy when I was 19, where I trained to be a cryptologic maintenance technician. Uh, I worked in satellite communications and ocean surveillance. After my, after my Navy career, I settled in Maine, uh, where for the last 22 plus years, I've worked in data analytics in pharmaceutical and healthcare industries. Uh, as Senator King said earlier, uh, a master's in cybersecurity from Thomas College is a great thing, and I can attest to that. I got mine last year, and it's opened up really great opportunities for me. So let's talk a little bit about 5G and what it is. It's not, uh, it's not five gigabits or five gigahertz. It's, it's the fifth generation of the, uh, of the digital cellular network. Uh, there's a new generation of cellular networks about every 10 years. Uh, 5G, as you can see on the graphic, is, is 100 times faster than the, what we currently have 4G or LTE, you might know it as. And you can see the previous generations, three, two, and one, uh, they don't even make the chart. They're, they're that much slower. So uh, 1G started in Japan in 1978, came to the USA in 1980. It was analog. That means phone calls only, no texts. This, uh, the, the phone you see on the picture there is, is affectionately referred to as the brick. Uh, it was less about function and, and really more of a status symbol than anything. The second generation launched in 1991. This is where we moved from analog to digital. Uh, parents started to buy phones for their kids uh, as a safety measure. The 2G phones had increased security. Uh, the form factor was smaller, so they were, they were small enough to fit in your pocket. You had phone calls and texts, although the texts were pretty slow and unreliable with 2G. Everybody can uh, relate to this picture. 2001 saw uh, the third generation of cellular and the birth of the iPhone. It was the beginning of the mobile internet. Video calls were a possibility now and you could browse the mobile internet on your phone. 2011 marked the launch of 4G and the demand for faster mobile net inter internet growing. 4G was five times faster than its predecessor. The number of phone apps exploded. Everybody wanted to be on, they wanted to use the mobile internet. They wanted new applications. 4G brought about innovations like social media, citizen journalism, and wearable tech like Fitbit. So that brings us to 5G. 5G is launching right now, and it's, it's already in a few selected cities. This generation of cellular is no longer about phones. 5G is going to fundamentally change the way that we live our lives every day. Things like connected smart cities where garbage trucks don't wait till Wednesday to pick up your garbage. They come when they sent the, the sensor tells them that you have a can out there and it's full, it's waiting for them. It's gonna enable things like uh, self-driving cars, traffic management, gas and water leak detection, smart environments. 5G has low latency, it requires low power. And so low latency means it gets that data up to the cloud, processes it and gets it back quick. Um, 
it has high bandwidth. It uses something called millimeter waves. Millimeter waves can fit all the other cell systems in use inside them. Cell towers are not going to look like what you think, what, what they look like now. They're going to look more like metal pizza boxes. They're called small cells and there's going to be a lot of them. We're going to see a convergence of technology with 5G. 5G, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, and the Industrial Internet of Things. Estimates are that by 2025, there'll be 50 billion connected devices. I think that's conservative. I feel like sometimes I have about 50 billion in my house alone. <laughs> this, the, all these devices generate massive amounts of data. 5G, you, with its low latency, can send that data up to the cloud, process it with AI, and get it back to the device quick enough to enable things like vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, vehicle-to-infrastructure communication. These are really important things with self-driving cars. Remote surgery. You know, you've got nearly instantaneous calculation and, and uh, getting it back to the device so that they can make these really important decisions. So with all this great technology comes risk. Uh, network virtualization is something that we're going to be seeing in 5G. It's where we're going from hardware-based operations to software-based operations. This introduces an attack convenience for criminal actors and rogue nation states. Another thing we talked about was the fact that 5G is 100 times faster than 4G. That's a dramatic bandwidth expansion. Right now, cybersecurity solutions rely on real-time monitoring of network traffic. These solutions will be pushed beyond their limits with the speed of 5G. Lastly, I want to talk about the risk or threat of China. And in particular, I want to talk about Huawei. China, Huawei is a Chinese multinational tech company, and it has close ties to the government and military. Uh, U.S. and many of its allies have uh, accused Huawei of illegal surveillance through backdoors and wireless technology. Some, some big uh, corporations like Cisco have said that uh, Huawei is stealing intellectual property and committing corporate, corporate espionage. Right now, the U.S. and China are in a race in the five, for the 5G market, and China has a head start. 5G, the fiber optic network that has to be built for the backbone of this, was going to cost tens of billions of dollars to build. China is offering bargain basement prices for this, and it's working. There's many countries that are signing up for, for them to, to use their hardware. Huawei will control how, how data moves on 5G. There is a narrow distinction between controlling how data moves and controlling what data moves and to whom. Make no mistake, China and Huawei want that control. Thank you. We live in sobering times, work with all sorts of things. I'm not going to give Hunter a chance to go because he's already spoken and I don't have another PowerPoint from him. I'm going to Nick Hagen. Uh, Nick flew up here from uh, Huntsville. Alabama. Uh, he plays there. I, yeah, he does stuff, right? Nick, you're going to tell us a little bit, right? Yeah. Cool. Thank you, sir. All right. So uh, I'm Nick Hagen. I work for Raytheon. I'm a systems engineer. So pretty much from the beginning of a project that Raytheon has, uh, for in my case, it's radars. Uh, we support 20 radars all over the world that are used specifically for missile defense. So pretty much we take it from the design phase all the way to integration into Army systems and Navy systems, and then go back around and we do the sustainment and verify the security of the systems. And we work with every group all the way up through the design, civil engineers, uh, systems engineers that don't do what I do, um, software engineers and everything, and we all work together to make a functioning product for the Missile Defense Agency in my group. So I'm going to start out talking about the system development life cycle. So uh, this is pretty much what everything we do is based around. So in the beginning, we gather requirements from the customer. So we all sit down in the engineering review board say what does this need to be able to do 
what's the time restrictions on what we need it to do, and other things like that that will allow us to judge what will actually need to be done by this radar and how much security we can put into it without impacting the functionality of this radar. So after that, we go into the design where we do a lot of documentation, uh, talk about what we are going to deliver to the customer, uh, do documents saying this is how we are going to deliver cybersecurity needs. And then after that, we go into the development phase, which is also implementation depending on who you talk to. We call it implementation at Raytheon. Uh, so we actually will build it based off the design we have got signed off by the customer and build it in a test environment, usually in a lab. And then we test it, see if we can break it, see if we can make it better, see if we can get more security than we thought out of it without hurting functionality. We fine tune it to exactly what we want it to be. So after that is the integration. This is like the fun part where we take a prototype that we actually have working and we take it and put it into place for our customer and we see if we can run flight tests with it and ground tests of actually say launch something into the air and see if we can track it with the radar and see the consequences of security on that system. So after this, so the whole time on a fresh build we'll use the risk management framework. This can be implemented after uh, but the way we usually do it is we try to bake it into the system development life cycle. So as Hunter talked about earlier, uh, NIST is a huge standard standards uh, company that we follow their standards. Uh, most government do, do, and like other small companies might. It's optional. So uh, in order to actually test this equipment, we have to get an authority to operate which means we have enough security in it and the risk has been considered acceptable to actually implement this into a classified environment, to plug it into military equipment and things to that nature. So the first step is categor categorization of the machine. So what classification level will this be? Because that will impact what security we implement to begin with, like what it actually will need to be authorized because if something's considered unclassified, it'll have less security requirements than something that's top secret. So from there, it gets into what controls we select. And as, again, as Hunter mentioned, uh, the SP800-53, which breaks down security controls that may be needed. And I expand on that in the next slide. So I'll save that for next. Uh, so after that is the implementation. So this is where we bring the security controls we selected to life. So for example, if we use a centralized auditing control, which means we don't want auditing to be contained on the machine that the audit logs are on. So we'll put it on a side server and from there we will monitor logs that way to save space on the device and have quicker functionality and better functionality on that machine. So after that is we have to assess and authorize it. So uh, from there we, uh, we have to sit with different groups, government, customers, um, other authorities and say this is what we have implemented, is this acceptable risk? And from there they can say yes or no and we have to fine tune it more, mitigate risks, and, or decide if they can be mitigated anymore. So if they say it's acceptable and can be mitigated, the ATO will be received and we can actually push that forward. So this is an example of the NIST SP800-53. So it'll break down into different control families. So for example, AU is audit and accountability. So this will be general auditing needs for security. How stringent they are is based off classification. Uh, centralized auditing will be, as I explained earlier, but that's considered in the audit and accountability. Uh, configuration management, so patch management, uh, as Ron talked about earlier. Uh, computer settings, so forced log off, uh, sending 
audit logs to a different machine. And then document handling. This one is one that people don't normally think about, but it is super important because we have to make sure we are keeping track of versions of documents, and usually people think of software for that, but documents are just as important to keep track of. So then access control, uh, need to know and least privilege are the biggest things that we focus about on access control. If you don't need access, you won't get it. So here is a control example. This is the centralized auditing one. So as you can see, it says, Data has to be offloaded to preserve the confidentiality and integrity of audit records. So pretty much that's just saying make sure it's not on the machine that has the audit logs. So here is like an example of the security technical implementation guide. So this will be what you go through to harden a system. It'll give you a score based off how many are meeting security needs and how many aren't. And you can go through and modify the settings as you go to raise your score. But then this is what's usually part of the ATO to show that you're meeting good security posture. And uh, here, this is one of the radars I worked on. It was in uh, Honolulu, Hawaii for two and a half weeks. It's about the height of the Statue of Liberty. So I wanted to use this example because it was a very good, we did a tech refresh of this, and it's a good example of how long it, and how much work actually goes into something like this. So it was, I think, about three years from the initial award of the contract to do a tech refresh, from the planning to the integration last year. So there's a lot that goes into this, so it's not an easy task, but depending on your customer and your actual needs, this will actually could be a very simple process as long as you're not trying to meet very high-end classified standards that some of the government agencies hold you to. And that's it. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. So what do you see some of the things we play with? Uh, we got a, a, a lab out there where all weapons are allowed. You know, don't get into that type of thing. Uh, and, and you realize that there are many different op levels to operate at, whether that is writing a 70-page security policy to speaking to a board of directors, to having the tech ideas. And I think you felt a little bit of the serious side of what goes on as students that have graduated recently. I want to give you an opportunity to say something off the script, anything that you want to say, or you're going to give us some ideas of, hey, if you're at home or you're at work, what do you think we should add as hands-on practice? Or what would you like to do? Hunter, would you start? Is that just because I reached for the mic? Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, man. So at home is what you're asking? Oh, no, I, either. Well, especially at work, um, if you have a small IT department or possibly an unestablished IT department, uh, what I've noticed most of all is the lack of the NIST controls that we've talked about here, uh, specifically 853 uh, IR8, which is Incident Response uh, Framework and Management. Um, I, we actually revamped the one for Main Emergency Management. Um, and it's going into effect in a few, hopefully a few weeks, if not a couple months. And, but it's completely missing uh, when I go and I uh, help the public infrastructure uh, work through their issues. Is they ask me, you know, what, what, could we, what could we implement? And I tell them, you need an incident response management policy. Um, so at work, I'd say, you know, policies, as, as much of a bear as they are to write, um, they're necessary to have especially in the, you're going to want one in the event of an incident so your head's not just spinning around. You actually have something to go back to as guidelines and be able to say, okay, step one is this, step two is that, step three is this, step four is that, and you have it signed by whatever supporting agencies you need. So in the event of an incident, you can go back to your policy and say, hey, we need you because this is happening and this is per our policy. So. He reached for the microphone. Go ahead, sir. No, I was just going to say that's a, that's a good point, Hunter. Um, I've been in an industry where um, disaster recovery, patch management, these things are mandated by the, by the government and government bodies. And it's interesting to see, you know, the difference in the culture in various businesses where that's not mandated and you see it happening anyway versus where it's not mandata mandated and it just doesn't happen. Um, so that's just, that is an interesting perspective. Um, thing I would add is for 
you know, we've got a lot of high school students here. Big thing to be aware of is you've all got smartphones now, I'm sure. Uh, be mindful of what uh, wireless uh, networks you're connecting to. Um, one of the things, you know, my example, you know, uh, guest, guest wireless, right? Almost everywhere has a guest wireless now, but um, it's quite typical for that guest wireless to be kind of unfettered, uncontrolled. If you're going to connect to it, so could uh, a guy sitting, you know, at Starbucks you know, on a laptop who's just looking for you to enter your bank credentials over that network connection. So just be mindful. Think about what you're doing. Think twice. I would, I would say that um, I think we tend to focus on all the complexities when we think about cybersecurity. And as you heard some of the speakers say today, it really is the simple stuff. It's really changing your default passwords, multi-factor authentication, training your employees. Um, you know, if you're a business, um, hire, hire penetration testers to come and tell you how good of a job you're doing. So I think, yeah, focusing on those simple things uh, can make a big difference. And I think to add to that penetration testing, that is huge because everybody will implement these new uh, controls for cybersecurity. Then they'll think, oh, well, we're all set. But in reality, you know, you're five years behind the ball. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's all about implementing and testing and implementing and testing until you reach that acceptable, acceptable risk that uh, Nick was talking about because you can never have 100% secure. If you have 100% secure, your productivity is going to drop. It's a, it's a balance between productivity and security. Um, so you need to be able to identify what your needs and risks are, and you need to be able to con you need to be able to cater um, your response to the to the largest risk to your company. Yeah. So one thing I can add is um, frameworks are important. So no matter how big or small your company is, uh, the framework will make your life a lot easier and cheaper. Uh, it's pretty much a guideline. While we use RMF for huge projects that cost millions of dollars. Uh, it's six steps that any small company could follow or business or municipality. Like they could all use that to do their cybersecurity in the way they want to in a way that they could make it fit for them. So one of the things we realized is that you can do cybersecurity and guarantee the total destruction of your company because you're overdoing it. A lot of you say, I don't have money for that. Well, then don't do it to that level. What is your appropriate level for your exposure? We're having this event because our risk levels here are quite appropriate. Other, organi other organizations find that different, to be different. Please do something that's appropriate for your organization. You can't spend a million dollars if you're a small not-for-profit. But go and speak to people that can do things at a reasonable cost that will give you reasonable protection. We've got a vendor in the audience that I happen to know that focuses on that part of the market. We have students that will give you some help, but we don't compete with vendors. And our students aren't going to be able to give you the guarantees and the focus. People exist right here in mid-Maine that can do that. Don't go overboard. Our problem that I hope you've heard is most of you are not doing enough. Don't hurt your organization. But as you profit from security, defend that security in an appropriate way. And there are a lot of things that we can do there. And, and why, does anybody else want to say something at this point? Um, if I could, yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk about uh, back to 5G. Um, and something called digital redlining. So it, it's important, I think, also in where we live in Maine. Digital redlining is impoverished, uh, rural, underserved communities uh, who are already falling behind. And, and with 5G coming, if, if we don't address it, they'll fall further behind in the technology gap. Um, we need to push you know, these big companies like Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile to spend the money to get the technology out to those communities. And th that's a, a, a huge expense. They have a problem, and we've got to solve that. It is cheaper to bring 1,200 megabytes to a city user than getting 150 megabytes to this area than get one megabyte to some of the really rural areas. So there's a huge loss incurred, and at some stage, we're going to have to chip in and find those. And we are doing that already. But it is, 
a leveler that they are missing out on because we're getting to those things, right? Yes. You are going to hand over your life to 5G a lot more than you realize over the next 10 years, all right? And, and realize with that comes risk. Um, so who wants to give some tips to people that can use at home or at work? Would you like me to start? start. Don't buy Chinese brand electronics. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I would say to, call, uh, to businesses, go to places you can get free information. All right, places like this. There's also InfraGuard. If you're in healthcare, join InfraGuard and get into the healthcare sh sharing stuff. If you're a bank, get into the banking sharing stuff. If you're in communications, let's get into that. InfraGuard is, is a nonprofit that runs in Maine, and I'm part of it, so I, I red flag of bias, okay? But the reason I'm there is because you get access to early alerts and information. When I had four hours to become an expert on COVID, I used a whole pile of stuff that was ready, plus the CDC and the rest. You want that in this area so that when you get slapped by a shock, you've got a way to go back. Sometimes you plan ahead. Two computers, three different ways, four different ways to get to Wix and all of those things. So we could fall back when stuff happened. You want to have some of that ready in your side without breaking the bank. What's a good password? A long password that is ugly for computers. Length is ugly for computers. People don't like squigglies. We don't remember them. So how's about using a couple of words that don't make sense together? All right? How about some moral advice for the high schoolers in the room who just heard you talk about all this really cool tech? <laughs> Morals in terms of ethical hacking? If you... Where can I get a mind out? <laughs> www. <No. laughs> okay, how what's it worth, sir? <laughs> so, those are real things, and, and when you hear those words from school students, you hear about a rubber ducky, a bash bunny, or you hear about a pineapple, you realize that bad things are happening in your classroom or at your school. That's why that little scenario came up. All right? And you've got to realize that you can find those things. And there are ways of doing it. IDS, IPS, and all of those things are there so that you can't do it. But at the airport, you might not have that type of trust. So anybody that heard me that's going to find this stuff, realize they're really easy to find because they're so well known. All right? And uh, Thomas, if we find something like that, we go to the police, no discussion. That's it. Bye. And I suggest that any school that gets into that does the same. Because our students know we can't mess with that. No, we can't do that. We've got the red network for baddie stuff, right? And you will get caught. Nobody's perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. And you all leave digital footprints. So you'll eventually get caught. Yeah, well, it's pretty bad when six of us are sitting in a study room as IT barges through the door. And that happened. Someone ran the, yes. I'm oh, sorry, you stay. Yes. I, uh, so we've had that happen, that IT stormed in because someone was running a tool and they were on the wrong network. You're allowed to do that on the red network, you know, red cable, all right, that's different to blue cable, all right, but they made a mistake. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so thank you all for coming back. I, I think it's wonderful to see where you are now, but keeping in mind that there are some high school students here. What advice do you have for them? Or was there something really exciting that happened in your undergrad here? Or can you talk to them a little bit about how you get to where you are now? And I don't, is, I, is it all a bunch of work? Or is it like, you know, tell me about, tell me about your experience. I bet, I know Hunter's going to have the same exact comment as me. I don't know, Nick, what your experience was. But I can tell you that um, one of the benefits I had of going into this technological degree is that there's like real jobs out there while you're in college where you can actually make money and you're not making minimum wage. You're able to learn really cool stuff out in the field um, and actually have a job that pays. So that, I think that was an opportunity that I had. I know Hunter had. Yeah, I mean, uh, the private sector in and of itself was they – they pay handsomely when you actually um, have a little bit of information going into an internship. Um, but also being able to use, I, like I said, I interned at SAPI. I was, I was there for a bit when Dash was there. And 
I used a lot of what I learned at SAPI back at school as well. Um, and it was just a crisscross the whole time because all the networking knowledge that I learned with the team at SAPI, I just brought over into the school, into the, into the, uh, the education world. So it's really just finding that balance. But I got my first internship at SAPI after my freshman year. Um, so I, w I then worked there for two and a half years. Um, I mean, I didn't even, I just worked there through the school year too. So I was always be able to bounce ideas off of professionals in the field that are actually working it every day and then being able to write about a form of it for my homework. So I was constantly learning no matter where I was, whether I was at school or at work. Um, but it was also cool being able to learn things at school and then you take it to work and then they show you how they implement a version of that in the workplace. So you can actually see it being used in the real world. So then it's easier when you're trying to research something like that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And you know, I don't know where you guys are at in high school, you know, where you're at, but if, if you're a senior right now, you're legitimately a year away from where Hunter was at when he accepted his first internship. So just things to think about. Um, and I was in the same position. I, from my freshman year, I was an intern at Central Maine Power. So again, very, very similar situation, so. And when I say, and the thing about going into like the cyber field is that um, really any computer science field is when there's a need, there's usually money followed by it. So they're usually throwing money at you and if, if there's a need for you. And if you're good and they keep you, they pay you more. So I don't know, I, I'm usually pretty driven by money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you haven't spoken. Did yeah. you earn any money in school? Yeah. yeah, so um, the big thing I learned was don't be afraid to like take a chance on a job or anything. Uh, I wouldn't be where I am if uh, Frank didn't convince me to apply for a job I didn't think I would get. Uh, so that's how I got my internship at Raytheon, and I've been there since I got the internship and haven't even looked at other jobs. So they've treated me very well. Um, they've pretty much done anything I've asked and have done more than I have ever asked. So the big thing I would say is, if you don't think you're good enough for a job, apply anyway. The worst they can do is say no, and the best they can do is change your life, so. Yeah, yeah just, just to build on, on what you said a little bit uh, about taking a chance. So I obviously had a little different path. I was a non-traditional student. Uh, when I finished up my undergraduate, I took some cybersecurity courses and I found that I, I just loved them. I came here looking to uh, get an MBA and uh, after talking to uh, Michaela, um, she said, hey, I, I think maybe you'd be interested in this new cybersecurity program we have and, and I was absolutely sold. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a different path for me, but I would say, you know, pursue your passion, take a chance and, and find something you love and find a way to make money at it. And um, something to go off of what Nick was saying, um, you know, when you go into your first internship, employers kind of understand that you haven't really worked in the field yet. Really, you're coming in there with educational experience. So while you're, in, you know, in your first year or two of college, take the extra time um, and, you know, go out of your way a little bit and learn something a little bit extra. You know, start messing around with some tools, start finding some free uses, start finding some free tools online to mess with just to get your feet wet in it. So that way when you and all of your classmates go to apply for the same internship, there's something on your resume, you know, as a skill that you have that your classmates don't have. You know, maybe that's the skill that the employer is looking for and maybe, maybe it's just that extra motivation that you went out there and you learned this on your own that the employer is looking for. So, you know, don't just take it from what school's doing for you, but take that, take the, take the knowledge you learn at school and apply it to some extracurricular activities and put that on your resume because all that's going to help you in the long run. So I've got a pop question after my next thing. What is your best resource that you like because it's cool, it's different, it's interesting, or because someone might like it? I'm going to come back with that question, okay? So... What we do at Thomas is we have relationships with organizations. And we cover most of the leading organizations. We're the only organ, uh, institution that has a formal contract with WEX. And I believe we have students that were sponsored by WEX. You got a bus to get here, am I right? All right, are they not in the room anymore, gone back? So we've got those sorts of relationships with most of our students getting more requests than anything else. And when I said earlier there is a demand in cyber, we try and address that as best we can. 
I could get 400 jobs for cyber, but I can't get more than 30 new students. Help. Our country needs you. We need you. Especially if you're female, because we have too many males. And like all the males, there's enough work for you, but if you're a female, you come at things in a different way, and we need those skills as well. We really want to get the other 48% that don't consider computers and cyber. Alright? And whether it's at high school or otherwise, we are getting investments and uh, a few days a few days ago, we announced that we would be running a cyber camp working with InfraGuard at Thomas. Here's a, a glassy. On the 21st of July, high school students that will be in grades uh, 10 through 12 or 9 through 12 next year. So if you're in 12th grade this year, you're not part of it because it's after you've graduated, right? And it, you come in here on Sunday night and we're going to play. We have the FBI dropping in on multiple location, uh, occasions. We are copying the InfraGuard National Cyber Camp. You are going to go through a complete scenario, and you're going to from zero, go from zero to capture the flag by Friday. Your fees for this are uh, around 50% sponsored, paid by others that want to invest in you. And it's going to happen here at Thomas College the 21st of July onwards. If you want to find out more, go onto our web, uh, website and type cyber camp. Is it one word or two? Someone will tell me. One, one word, cyber camp, and you will find that. Go to thomas.edu. Anybody in Maine is open. There's no commitment to Thomas afterwards. This is a service for the people we need. And you're coming to Thomas, you're going to experience it here. We have a full time faculty, and we have all InfraGuard members invited to come along and interface and speak to students that might be interested. So if you're a vendor, think about that. If you're an InfraGuard member, think about that and see how you can help our workforce close these gaps that we so desperately need closed. Gentlemen, do you have something to say? Yeah, um, so for sources of information, I like darkreading.com. Uh, I like, okay, only one. Give someone else a chance. Can always oh, get I second. Oh, I gotta plug like. Darknet Diaries, my favorite <laughs> podcast. It's awesome. It's about it's about cyber attacks and and uh, the whole backstory on them. Love it. Yeah, duck eggs, right? Duck eggs, black duck eggs. That's the best one. <laughs> okay, it's interesting. I was also gonna say dark reading, but another one I'll say is um, you know if you're looking for trustworthy information, it's really good to go to actual government websites, and I don't need to list them all out. And if Hunter talked about it earlier, but um, the actual government websites are going to have factual information that you can trust as opposed to just, uh, you know, maybe CNN.com. You can't necessarily. Any news organization, you've got to go to core so that you get pure information. Gentlemen, you want to add any? Did they steal them all? No, they didn't. Um, so my big thing, I'm shame another shameless plug is honestly my favorite one to go to is InfraGuard. Um, you go to the publications page and you have all the flash alerts and you have group, you, you have um, publications that come out from InfraGuard and it's all the up-to-date information that you're going to be looking for. Um, really up-to-date news stories that you need to know and then you have your more technical knowledge if there's any alerts that come out. Um, really for me, my, my go-to is InfraGuard. So InfraGuard is a closed organization. You've got to be apply, you've got to apply, you've got to be an adult out of high school. Uh, we get Thomas students in because we're so close to them. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's really important stuff, uh, especially for courses like cyber warfare and things like that. Nick, you got anything favorite? Yeah. A military site? So I use LinkedIn a lot. Um, a lot of people, a lot of my connections from Huntsville, it's a very invested place in academia. So a lot of people, they write their own articles and their own research and post it. So I learn a lot from reading people I've worked with or met just around town and read what they have to say about cyber and almost anything else. You never know what they're going to post. Any other questions from the audience? Mr. Timekeeper, how many seconds have I got? We're pretty good. I'm just going to jump off after, after you. All right. Any questions? Anything pressing? Jump off, sir.
I, I'd just like to thank everybody who came here. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a real a weighty subject. Uh, many of us are, are just really new at this, but I think trying to get immersed in it, uh, there's nothing better than being around the experts who actually have dedicated their lives to, to do that. So thank you very much for being here. I want to thank our panelists and our speakers who uh, came here this afternoon who may not be with us. A special thanks to uh, Dr. Appen, uh, for really championing this subject along with, with WEX. We started out last summer and we thought what would be a great idea is to talk about this, to give everybody an update. And what didn't hurt necessarily was a lot of the uh, free publicity of every day there's either a data breach or an information hack and so forth. So it's really on people's minds. They just don't know where to go to get the information. So I want to thank everybody here. Uh, before, before we uh, send you off, uh, please stay around after this if you have some time to network. Actually at 5.30 we also have a thing called Central Maine Tech Night. Um, it's just a bunch of folks that are in the area that get together and talk about technology and hear about what's uh, new out there. Something a little bit different, but there's a company tonight who's talking about how they've taken actually lobster shells, uh, used it through a technology and turned it into skincare products. So every uh, once uh, every month we get together. It happens to be right in this room at 530. So please stick around. If that's something of interest to you, uh, please join us then as well. But uh, thank you everyone. If you could give them a hand. <laughs> I joined West in the summer of 2016 as part of the IS risk and compliance team. Our team mainly focuses on PCI compliance. If you're unfamiliar with PCI, it's a security compliance framework used by companies who store, process, or transmit car data. Since joining WEX, a majority of our infrastructure has migrated to the AWS cloud. This means our applications, web servers, and backend, like our database, are all in the cloud. One thing about AWS is it's actually PCI compliant, as uh, most other major cloud providers are. So what does this mean for us in compliance? Uh, are we out of the job? Well, that's not quite the case. Um, there's actually a shared cloud security responsibility model, and this is something to get familiar with if you're planning on going into uh, cloud security. So what the customer is responsible for and what AWS is gonna be responsible for. So the customer is responsible for security in the cloud. So that's going to be our data. Um, you know, making sure that it's encrypted, making sure the proper monitoring and logging is going to be in place and to protect the integrity of the data. Um, our platform, our applications, and our identity and access management. So user provisioning, making sure uh, users don't have more rights than they should, as well as their services don't have more rights than they should to access data. Um, our operating systems, making sure that things are patched is going to be the customer's responsibility, uh, as well as the firewall, you know, making sure the correct ports are in place, as well as routing and, and access to the internet. Now, AWS is going to be, be responsible for security of the cloud. Um, this is more the physical side. Think software, providing us with the software, hardware, and the physical security of the data centers themselves. So the one that I want to focus on here is uh, identity and access management. Uh, the reason is because I believe that um, this is often overlooked and can sometimes be uh, the biggest threat to our data. So why are attackers attracted to the cloud? Um, Companies trust a lot of sensitive data to cloud service providers like AWS. Think healthcare information, credit card data, financial reports. You would think most security breaches take place because of sophisticated zero-day attacks against the cloud providers themselves. While credential theft is actually a much greater and more common threat. Credentials are the gold mine for attackers for one very important reason. Uh, they're the keys to the kingdom. Granting access to a vast amount of data by sometimes just exploiting a single data source. Um, so the importance of using proper authentication, um, a survey by AirMedic was done on 300 chief information security officers, and 70% of them came back and said that improper authentication was, in their opinion, a top threat to cloud data. 
So a real life example of this, um, there's no better example than the Capital One breach, uh, where over 100 million customers had their information stolen from them. So I wanna go through from a high level and break down how this happened. So it starts with a WAF, a web application firewall, sitting on the external portion of the network. This is filtering HTTP traffic in and out of the web application. The attacker was able to use a server-side forgery request um, exploit in order to hijack the credentials of this WAF. Attached to the WAF was a role. And what a role is in AWS, it allows permissions to services and users. In this case, the WAF is using the role. It's allowing uh, permissions to use a service F3, which you can see up in the top right corner. Now, what F3 is, think of it like a giant folder, and these folders are called buckets. Um, you can put everything in there from images to logs, customer information. Um, in this case, Capital One had both uh, information that the WAF was using, writing logs to, as well as customer information in the same place. Now, through using the WAF and using the role permissions, it was able to use the get object permission and the attacker was able to exfiltrate uh, the customer information out of AWS and into their hands. Now, how could this have been prevented from happening? You would think that the best way to prevent this would just be to encrypt the data and you'd be all set. That's actually wouldn't have worked in this scenario as the WAF would actually have had the ability, the, the keys for the encryption to be able to unencrypt this data. And since that attacker had control of the WAF, they would also have the keys to unencrypt the data. So this is actually a pretty simple approach in fixing it, but would actually do the trick. So the first thing that we want to do is separate out the resources. So instead of having both customer information and the WAF logs in a single bucket, we can split this into two buckets, bucket one, bucket two. Um, storage in AWS is unlimited, so there's no reason that we shouldn't do this. Um, um, this solution wouldn't have fixed the problem in itself, as as you can see in this, uh, the role permissions, it's actually allowing S3 asterisk, which means access the entire S3 service. So what we can do is remove that asterisk and put bucket two. So now the WAF is only able to access bucket two where its logs are. We can actually reduce these privileges further by removing some of the actions that this uh, role is giving the WAF. So the ability to list all buckets, get objects, and delete objects. Now it only has the permissions to do what it needs to do for its job function. Um, let's go ahead and take this a little bit further. Um, so here we have two applications, app one and app two. They're both using a single role to access these AWS services. Now, if these two applications are performing two different functions, then um, they should not be using the same role. So what we can do here is go ahead and split the role into two finer grain roles that only have permissions to the services and data that these applications need in order to do their job. Um, this is a example of applying the least privileged model. So why should credential theft matter to you? Um, it should matter to you uh, because applications like Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, things you use every day, your phone, the text messages on it, uh, the photos on it are all uh, backed up to the cloud by default. You can turn this feature off, however, most people don't. Um, and it's, it could, be, could end up bad for you, you know, if an attacker was able to get all your credentials and have the ability to post your photos and your text message on for the whole world to see. Now, you might not have anything to hide, but I don't think most people would be comfortable with this happening. Um, so we can, so there are some ways that you can prevent this. Um, first off, the best thing you can, can do is create a complex password um, and not use the same password across all of your accounts. I know this can be sometimes annoying, but it's, it is a big help. Um, if multi-factor authentication is made available to you, you should use it. And as well as 
if you're in an insecure place like a coffee shop, for example, or at a hotel, you should try and use a VPN if you have access to one in order to keep your data safe in transit. So in conclusion here, I'm not trying to scare anyone away from the cloud. In fact, I'm a big supporter of it. It's actually far more secure than your local backup and in many ways more secure than traditional on-premise storage. Just be aware the cloud is different and should be looked at from a different security perspective and a new chapter in securing infrastructure and data.